Yeah. Okay, folks. Um, so it's just nine o'clock. So we'll start the process. Um, so firstly, welcome everyone. Thank you all so much for uh, coming to this workshop. I believe it's the first of its kind anywhere. So uh, this is really exciting. Um, there's a lot of interesting stuff to talk about. Um, so first, a couple of things. Uh, if you're giving a presentation this morning, if you can download your files to the Dropbox, so you should have that link in your email, um, and, and add those slides, you can play them off of the, the live pad up here. Um, <clears throat> so firstly, thanks to the CCA for facilitating this. Um, it's been really seamless. Um, it's fabulous. Enjoy the hospitality. Um, thanks to Mordecai for pushing for this. Phil and Yuri and David for supporting what we're, what we're doing here. Um, and thank you for coming along. And hopefully we'll have a really interesting uh, conversation over the next three days. OK, so um, why are we here? Uh, for a variety of reasons. Um, LIGO is detecting a large number of black hole, black hole, stellar mass black hole, black hole mergers, as we know. Uh, they seem to be overmassive. Um, and the cartoon picture that we have is something that looks like this. Hopefully, by the end of the workshop, we'll have a better picture than a cartoon that I've um, put up here. Uh, but the idea is basically at the center of a galactic nucleus, we've got a supermassive black hole. Um, we have a swarm of angry bees going around the central queen bee. So we've got stellar mass black holes orbiting at various angles. And if you throw in a gas disk, uh, into that, you generate an active galactic nucleus. And some fraction of those stellar mass black holes in the galactic nucleus will end up in the disk, just with geometric arguments. Another fraction will get grand down into the disk. And so if you're interested in a place where we can accelerate black hole, black hole mergers in the universe, these are good places to look. OK? Um, <clears throat> so if you have that picture, <clears throat> And you can generate a, a, a prediction for a rate of black hole, black hole mergers, depending on what you think an AGN is, what your binary fraction is, um, the rate of occurrence of AGN, the number of black holes, stellar mass black holes that you would expect in the galactic nucleus, and sort of how efficient the whole process is. And so you can generate uh, a rate estimate. All of these parameters are pretty darn uncertain. And that's part of what we're going to be talking about here over the next three days. Right? So it could be that a lot of these numbers are on the large side. Right? I think it's unlikely, but it's, it's possible. Uh, in which case, a large fraction of the mergers that we're seeing with LIGO are coming from this channel. Okay? In that case, I'll put on my optimistic hat, right? You don't need to know anything about baseball uh, or New York sports teams. But basically, this hat is worn by people who expect to win every game. Right? <laughs> so um, if I'm wearing this hat, then I expect that these numbers are pretty high and that we get a large rate of black hole, black hole mergers in AGN disks. Um, if you wear this hat, then you expect that this channel will produce a lot of uh, uh, mergers, a lot of black hole, black hole mergers. If that's the case, then we learn some things about AGN disks. A few of us in this room get some personal satisfaction of having predicted that light would see over massive black hole, black hole mergers. But I would argue that actually, <clears throat> we should wear a pessimistic hat. So this is the hat of the New York Mets. They suck. Um, <laughs> if you wear this hat, then it means that secretly you expect to lose most games, right? So you're a pessimist. So if you're wearing your pessimistic hat, you expect that somewhere something is going to go wrong in this, right? We're missing something. Uh, you know, some number is is wildly overestimated, or we're, we're we're just missing something, missing some physics that we haven't really thought of. So if you wear this hat. I would argue that actually we get more constraints on AGN disks from LIGO than we can from electromagnetic results right now. 
the reason for that is because I have a <coughs> sophisticated model of an AGN disk right here. It's color coded. So the hot bit is here, it's blue in the middle. The cooler bit is red on the outside, and sort of it's a multicolor disk. It changes aspect ratio with distance from the central supermassive black hole. <laughs> and this thing can have an effect on our models of uh, hmm, galaxy formation. Um, it, it, it seems to play a role in, in lambda CDM. We think it plays a strong role in lambda CDM. So right now, electromagnetic observations are basically allowing us to test models of the photosphere of these things. LIGO is for the first time allowing us to probe within the AGN disk. So we can test the density and lifetime of these systems. And so if you wear a pessimistic hat in this channel, if you say that something is going wrong, we actually learn more about AGN disks than you win, okay? So um, our goal at this workshop is to figure out what hat you would rather wear. I understand if you're from Boston, you can't never wear this hat. Um, <laughs> but we can replace it with a, with a Boston Red Sox hat. That's fine. Um, so essentially what, what I'd like us to do over the next three days is think about what you would want to see, uh, what work we need done in various fields, in order to choose between an optimistic hat or a pessimistic hat, or maybe we end up somewhere in between with a, I don't know, Kansas City hat, all right? Um, so um, the goal of, of the workshop is first day in the morning, we're gonna, um, we're gonna outline the problem, the various aspects that feed into the problem that we're thinking about. So we're very much like the blind folks who are trying to figure out what an elephant is. We have some experts in this room on the tail of the elephant. They're going to tell you about the tail of the elephant. We've got some experts in the room on the legs of the elephant. And they're going to tell us about the legs of the elephant. We also have some trunk experts, some ear experts, and the side of the elephant experts. And hopefully we can put it all together so that by the end of this morning, we'll have an outline roughly of what the elephant is. right? or maybe where it's broken, okay? So if you have, whoops, if you have slides to present this morning, if you can please download them to the Dropbox. Um, we're gonna have 20 minutes per uh, session, per, uh, per primer. Uh, keep your questions till the end. We'll have about five minutes in between these little discussions, these primers, uh, where if you have general questions, you can raise them then. And then we'll get the next people up to, to uh, to set up for their, for their presentation. So these are gonna be the longest talks you're gonna hear all through this workshop, 20 minutes max. We're, we're, we're aiming for conversation in the, in the discussion session, so please send your one slide to, um, to the session that you're interested in so joining in the discussion. So Ben has already got a bunch of uh, slides for, for this afternoon, but if you have, if, you, if you've yet to contribute something, Please email him your one slide. Uh, likewise, Zoltan, uh, Mordecai are right here. Uh, Jillian and Sada can also take your slides for, for those sessions. All right. So um, uh, when we um, uh, so when we have our discussions, the goal is that the the chair will basically present your one slide and you can talk about whatever it is you want. You can advertise your work. You can advertise someone else's work. Uh, you can raise a question that you think we're not, hasn't really been considered or should be considered. Um, whatever it is, uh, please contribute one slide and email the chair of the, the discussion session, okay? Um, so when, uh, so for our speakers this morning, my phone is going to make an obnoxious noise when you're 20 minutes are up, um, and then that means I will stand up and come and be obnoxious to, to you, okay? Um, and so if you can please hold your questions for after the 20 minutes, so we get a, a rough intro to each topic, and then we'll, we'll move to the next speakers, okay? 
So I have a few minutes left, um, but that's okay. Any questions about just the general format or anything else? Uh, if you feel, by the way, if you're speaking, if you feel particularly optimistic <laughs> or you feel particularly pessimistic, please go right ahead and wear uh, the hat that you feel is appropriate. And, and please tell us why you think you're, you're pessimistic or you're, you're optimistic, okay? So please please use these. Okay, I'll leave them up here. Uh, you can't. They warned us against that, but yeah. yeah okay. So, okay, uh, folks, our first speaker is uh, Kaya Mori. Um, he's going to talk to us about populations of objects in galactic UPI, uh, in particular in our galactic <laughs> Okay? Okay, so good morning, everyone. Uh, we'll be talking about uh, our recent discovery of uh, um, X -ray, uh, um, sorry, X ray binaries in the center of our galaxy, and this work was presented in our nature paper last year. We have some continuing work which I will present. I have a paper coming up in a month or two. Everything <laughs> I need to do, I will read that paper. Oh, yeah, I used to. Yeah, that's Yes, so everything I will talk about will be, uh, pub, um, in, will be in my paper uh, to be submitted to UPJ in a month or two. So let me start with some big picture. So our nature paperwork is a part of a big um, observation program, which we have been running with a new star. So I will start with a Chandra's uh, X-ray view of the galactic center. This is 
two degrees along the galactic plane and then 0.8 degrees across the plane. Um, that's the Chandra X-ray image. And you can see all these uh, green dots. These are all X-ray emitting point sources. So Sagittarius A-star is stars in the center. You have more point sources there just because you have more stars and binaries. And also because Chandra spend more time, uh, multi-million seconds uh, in the center, so you have more exposure time. That means you can reach out to uh, fainter sources. So we started with uh, these three big questions. And then we followed up this same exact field with new star, which you can see in this uh, yellow uh, rectangular regions. So the first question is we have 9,000 Chandra sources in this field. What are these sources? So the short answer is they're mostly magnetic cities with white dwarf. And the second question is new star discovered um, hard X-ray emitting diffuse emission uh, near the center. It's about four by eight parsecs. Um, that was a discovery about 20 keV, which previous hard X-ray test couldn't reach. And then later on, we figure out that diffuse emission is an unresolved population of a bunch of magnetic CBs. Particularly, it's a, you know, it's an intermediate polars with a 0.8 solar mass white dwarf mass on average. And if you go down to the center, in the center parsec region, that's the topic of my talk. And what's the source population there and emitting some x-rays there? So the center parsec region has been very interesting for the last decades. Uh, especially, can you find some uh, buckle cusp of uh, stars and x-ray emitting point sources? And it's also important to gravitational wave detection like uh, that, uh, no, uh, we, we are, we're going to be talking about today. And then where are these radio parsers and millisecond parsers? We discovered one magnetar in the center. Do we have more? And the really interesting question is where are these black holes in the center of parsecs as predicted by some papers, including uh, most recent ones by Gen Zorov and uh, Zorgen Kosis. I think Dr. Kosis is here. Okay. Hi, nice to see you. OK. so. Uh, we have been running these two major approaches for detecting X-ray binaries in the center. The first approach is, like I said, Chandra telescopes spend multi-million seconds looking at all these uh, hundreds of sources in the center of parsec. So we're going to look at each of them and then characterize its X-ray spectra and then uh, timing information so we can identify them. Uh, that's one way. And the other way is uh, some of these X-ray binaries um, outbursts occasionally. Just the X-ray luminosity goes up by many orders of magnitude, which was also detected by a Swift X-ray telescope monitoring the galactic center every day. And then we followed up these uh, transients by a new star and Chandra and sometimes uh, infrared and radio. So that's going to be adding uh, more X-ray sources in the center. So there are two approaches we, we are running. And what are our targets? So mostly these X-ray point sources are powered by accretion. So we are talking about LMXPs, high-mass uh, high HMXPs uh, with black hole and neutron stars, uh, or magnetic CVs. There are many of them. Or another class is called millisecond power, so it's uh, rotation power. So these are our targets. And there are various ways of you know, di um, distinguish between these guys. Uh, for example, lumino using luminosity or spectral shapes or variability. I'm going to go into uh, more details later on. So, Especially, there are many magnetic CBs against some uh, LMXBs. So how do you know uh, which one is which? So this slide will show you two contrasting X-ray spectra. On the left, you can see a persistent neutron star LMXB in the galactic center. And X-ray spectrum starting from 2 keV up to 40 keV by adding new star uh, data, it's a nice smooth continuum with a soft photon index, around 1.5 to 2. On the other hand, magnetic CVs show something different, which is a much harder continuum and a clear ion emission lines. So this is one of the information we are going to use to say, hey, that's LMXB. is a black core neutron star on magnetic CVs. OK? Then uh, we started this work uh, almost three years ago. Um, looking at the galactic center, so this is a zoomed-in image of Chandra's, you know, um, uh, of the Chandra sources. Again, Sagittarius is somewhere in the middle. I think this is a four parsec radius. You see 
hundreds of tons of sources. And we started using 1.4 millisecond ACES S observation first, and we published a paper last year in Nature. And our continuing work is actually analyzing more data from ACES S for three million second observations. And then, just to be conservative, we presented 93 brightest sources in this field with net counts about 100. So make sure we can measure the spectra and light curves very well. So um, like I said in the two slides before, hardness ratio is a key. Uh, because some sources are not bright enough to give us enough counts to give us a nice looking spectra like you saw so, uh, two slides away. So we're gonna, we started classifying all these sources based on the hardness ratio. So in y-axis, you can see harder continuum sources like magnetic CVs and softer sources down as a function of radius distance from Sag star. So farther away from Sag star, you can see hard sources consistent with magnetic CVs. If you go into the center below one parsec, you can start seeing some magnetic CVs and some softer sources. So you see some two populations here inside one parsec as opposed to outside one parsec where you see most magnetic CVs. So um, if you have enough counts for each source, you can just look at the spectra. So this is a soft source, which appears to be a nice pile of soft sources in the two different observations. This is ACSI and this is ACSS. You don't see any ion lines. On the other hand, if you pick a bright hard source, you can see hard continuum and clear ion lines, just like this. So that's magnetic CVs. This is neutron star or black hole LMX piece. Okay, so uh, when we did, uh, when, when we expanded the uh, analysis to ACS S uh, data, we found another source um, which has soft non thermal spectra like this, and its light curve shows us some nice variability here over the last uh, 12 years or so. So if you, okay, one more slide. So for the fainter sources, what we can do is we can just stack up, let's say a dozen faint sources, and then make a combined spectrum. So again, this is a soft sources, stacked up, looking like a nice uh, power source. This is a stacked up hard sources, which will give you a hard continuum and a very prominent ion lines. So that's how you can uh, identify other, uh, a group of sources between hard and soft. So if you put together soft uh, non thermal sources in blue, they are distributed like this around Sag star. Sag star is here. It's a one parsec radius um, circle. And then hard sources, which are magnetic CVs, they are spreading out like a red points all over the place. And this non thermal source distribution is actually mostly aligned with the galactic plane. I'm gonna come back to this later on. So um, I'm just showing you our tiny analysis results. So out of the 13 non thermal sources, we detected nine of them are vari you know, variables, as you can see in some light curve here. So what are these sources? Uh, 13 soft non thermal sources. So like I said, nine out of 13 are not our are, are variable. So they are not millisecond parsers. So usually millisecond parsers are spinning at millisecond. Otherwise, at the longer uh, time scale, they don't really show up variability. They're a very stable system. So um, these sources are likely neutron star or black hole LMX piece. Other types are ruled out. <laughs> I'm, not gonna, I'm not getting into the details here. So the question is which one is a neutron star or black hole LMX piece? So to answer that question, I'm gonna come back to I'm gonna talk about the X-ray transients first. So away from the you know, Chandra program, Swift XRT has been looking at the galactic center every day over the last 13 years. So they never missed any outbursts down to 10 to 34 X per second. That's a very faint end of X-ray outburst. On the other hand, if you look at elsewhere in our galaxy, including global clusters, there's no such program. So you may be missing some fainter X-ray outbursts, okay? So, 
there is something called the VFX case, standing for uh, very faint actual transients. Their peak actual noise is actually below 10 to 36 hertz per second, down to 10 to 34. Swift program of looking at the galactic center discovered nine of them. Okay, so this is something new people have been interested in over the last decade. Um, so that's a nice progress in the galactic center. So back in 2016, the same SIFT program found two new X-ray transients in the galactic center, right next to Sajet star. So these two. New star followed up these two uh, transients, and we characterized their spectra and light curves. So first of all, these uh, peak X-ray velocity is about 10 to 37 Earth per second, so that's a bright end. We didn't detect any pulsation or type of X-ray burst. And there's no X-ray outburst detected from these sources in the last 20 years. And we found no counterpart in the Chandra catalog. That means in a quiescent state, these transients are very, very faint. So let's look at some X-ray spectra from New Star. That's three to seven, nine KB. We got many photons. When we fit the power law uh, model, you can clearly see nice broadened ion line and also asymmetric um, around the black core and neutron star. And also we detect the QPO around, at around 15 millihertz. So these are the <coughs> typical characteristics for the black core transients and also neutron star transients. So it's hard to distinguish between which one's which just from the, this kind of data, unfortunately. So, like I said, uh, Swift, X, Swift XMM and Chandra has been looking at the galactic center over the last 20 years. They discovered uh, many transients. Um, so let me go through this chart. So this is a number of transient as a function of distance from Sajay star in parsec. New star discovered one magnetar. Five of the VFXDs are in the center of three parsec. And we have three transients which are probably most likely a new, uh, black, uh, 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 black core transients. Otherwise, there are six core from neutron star MXPs with type of X-ray burst uh, so, or uh, pulsation. So in red, they are spreading out all over the place, up to 50 parsecs. And let's talk a little bit more about VFXT. So, like I said, five VFXTs in the center of three parsec, they had multiple bursts in the last 10 or 15 years. So they recur, they have recurrent outbursts. On the other hand, four VFXTs, these guys, just outburst once. And our speculation is maybe these four VFXTs had multiple outbursts, but they are actually outside the most sensitive uh, region by, uh, of, of the Swift telescope, so we probably missed that. So we think all these VFXTs probably had multiple outbursts over some years. And if you look at the local VFXTs, seven of them have been identified as neutron cell MXPs. There is one known black hole VFXT, uh, which outbursts twice, but there's one caveat, I think the distance is unknown. So if you use a larger distance, it may not become VFXT. So um, serious actually speculate VFXTs have a low accretion rate. That's why X-ray burst luminosity is actually lower due to the smaller uh, uh, accretion disk size. One path which is they are outer compact X-ray binaries, or if it's a neutron star system, strong magnetic field can truncate the disk like a propeller effect then accretion rate goes down. So combining all this information, um, we know uh, probably VFX is a neutron cell MXPs, in my opinion. So let's look at the, how often outburst happens for black hole systems and neutron cell systems. So like I said, six neutron cell MXPs in the galactic center, they had a recurrent uh, outburst. At least five VFXTs had a recurrent outburst. If you look at the local uh, neutron state MXPs, seven out of 12 did uh, outburst uh, multiple times. And other guys are probably VFXTs with only one outburst. Other guys are probably missed. On the other hand, if you look at the black hole transients, then 
they have a very long recurrence time. 4359 have recurrence time <coughs> about 50 years or longer. That's what you see here. So I just want to mention that uh, there are some outliers. One neutral cell MXP Saints 4 didn't outburst since 1970s. Or we have a famous black core MXP, which outbursts multiple times. So there are some outliers and great ones. So going back to the same histogram, um, number of X-ray transient versus distance from Sag A star, now I'm, I'm putting some uh, reasonable assumptions. Then again, six come from neutral star MXPs, nine BFXDs, and they're all in red, and I'm speculating they are neutron star MXPs. So that's how they dis get dis distributed. On the other hand, three transients, including the two transients in 2016 I mentioned, they had only one burst in 20 years. Okay, unlike these guys with multiple outbursts. And going back to my uh, Chandra uh, source analysis, like I said, there are 13 quiet and non thermal sources, but they never outbursted over the last 20 years. So based on the information I talked about, I would speculate these guys are also black white and mixed And then they're all sitting inside one person. So there's a spike here in black, and there's a one magnet tower. Okay, so right now, there are about even 15 neutron star 16 broad force, but that's not the whole story because we may have some hidden LMXV population. Number one, uh, if you look at the globular clusters, there are many neutron star LMXVs with a low accretion. They just give you uh, thermal emission, but no, not no thermal emission. These guys will be undetectable in the galactic center because we have a higher absorption by the ISM. We are not going to detect them. So they're hidden, they're there, but we just don't know how many. If you look at the black core system, we measured log n log s of the 13 quiescent black core LMXB candidates, and that's actually similar to the local black core's log n log s um, derived by Padilla. So if you extend this power law down to the faintest local black core LMXB's luminosity, you get about 500 to 1,000 black core LMXB's still hidden there. And then, like I said, three uh, X-ray bursts with only one outburst, you know, out, uh, one outburst um, could be some of them. Okay, then let's skip this, uh, but I can just talk about it. So if you take the three Braco transients and then uh, 500, 1,000 Braco MXPs still hidden, you can put some nice constraint on the outburst recurrence time, which can be like thousand years. Okay, so if you put together 13 quiescent black hole MXPs and then three transient black holes, then look at their distribution. It's, this is how it looks like. So three transients, 13 um, quiescent black holes, and in this scale, that's one parsec radius. In this case, it's better to probably use the nuclear star cluster, which is also aligned with the galactic uh, uh, plane, and looks like they are aligned. When we fit a two-dimensional Gaussian fit with a maximum light rate for the analysis, the centroid of this distribution slightly shifted from the sides here with some large error bar, and it's elongated, and its orientation is 23 degrees plus minus 13 degrees. Again, large error bar from the north, which is aligned to the NSC. Okay. Um, but let's be careful here, because the galactic center has all kinds of gas, uh, molecular cloud blocking X-rays. So there are two effects. One is you can see these contours representing a circumnuclear disk. That's a very thick um, molecular disk. If you have X-ray uh, sources behind it, you don't see any X-rays because of the absorption. That's number one. Number two, we have a very bright diffuse X-ray emission from Sagittarius star itself. There's a Parsimin nebula. There's an IR-13 star cluster. That's too bright uh, to detect any fainter X-ray sources. So you can see, you don't see, you, you can see there's really no 
um, soft non-thermal sources detected here. So I have two more slides. Okay. <laughs> then, uh, so we run a Monte Carlo simulation, assuming a spherical, a three-dimensional spherical uh, density profile. Uh, it goes like a power law. Uh, you can see here. And then we put the three-dimensional CND uh, structure here, which will hide, obscure your X-ray sources. Then what we came up with this is the spherical distribution is rejected at 98% confidence level. So, so it's still marginal. It's not three sigma. OK, so what do we learn in the future? or well, what's going on right now? So we are analyzing more ACSS data. Um, we have uh, collaborators looking at the Sajay star almost every day. So we have private access to uh, the point sources, as long as you don't touch Sajay star data. And we expect to increase the number of quiescent X-ray uh, binaries by a factor of three. That's, that's huge. Okay, and then we can do a variability study to distinguish between X-ray binaries and MSPs. Um, and then we keep doing swift modern the galactic center, so we may find a new X-ray transient every two years. And I'd like to know the nature of BFXTs. That's kind of important we, because we have nine BFXTs, and this will make a very good uh, science case for the Lynx X-ray observatory. And I will put my summary page here and take some questions. I'm feeling optimistic after that talk, so I have my Yankees hat on. So does anyone have any questions for our speaker? And I'll ask our next speakers to start coming up. Carl and are you? So given all that you described in the second half of the talk showing different slopes and iron lines and some sorts of, and some neutron stars and black holes. Um, can you describe a little bit more about using the hardness ratio as an indicator of whether it's a, a CV or a, a black hole or neutron star? Yes, yeah, so uh, coming back to this slide, so that's a broad band X-ray spectrum of the you know, black hole neutron star MXB versus uh, uh, magnetic series. And then uh, it's going back to the Muno's original paper back in 2009 or 2005. But uh, if you look at the Chandra band, which starts from 2 kV to 8 kV, just ignore the new star part. And then it looks very hard. And then with the iron line. So if you simply fit a single power law to this magnetic CV spectrum, you get a very hard photo index like zero. On the other hand, if you fit the neutron star MXP or black hole MXP spectrum from 2 to 8K, that's again Chandra bound, you get a photo index around 1.5 to 2. So that's, that has been verified by using the actual magnetic CVs. We run a bunch of simulations using XPEC and the actual MARC simulation, putting all these you know, uh, template magnetic CVs and then LMXPs on the action uh, Chandra data, run many simulations, verifying our hardness ratio uh, analysis valid as long as you have enough counts, which is 100 for ACS I case. It's a long story, which I can talk about, but in, even the Ch you know, Chandra's narrow band, you can clearly see the difference between magnetic CV and the LMXB. So we're going to leave it there. If you have more questions, we can discuss in uh, this afternoon's session. Uh, for any of our speakers, if you haven't been able to get into Dropbox, uh, we can use AirPlay. Yeah, so. but apparently, he was yeah, it's working. Dropbox. Okay, it's working. It's okay, working. so right, so we, we can either AirPlay or or use Dropbox. Okay, thank you. Okay, all right. So next up, we have a, a joint presentation. Um, uh, so next up, we have a, a joint presentation from uh, Carl Rodriguez and Fabio Antonini. They're going to give us a primer on dynamics of the objects that we expect in galactic UCI. So we heard, we heard something. Uh, uh, 5259. Oh, okay. Thank you. 
introduction to just sort of how black holes sort of behave in dense star clusters. There's going to be virtually none of my own stuff, none of, it's just going to be very, very top level, some back of the envelope rate calculations and a lot of pictures. And then I'm going to turn it over to Fabio, who's going to go a little more into detail about actual predictions from nuclear star clusters for binary black holes and things like that. So the general picture to have in mind with any star cluster, this is open cluster, globular cluster, galactic nuclei, is that it's pretty easy, right, to form black holes in as long as you have massive stars at some point during the evolution of a star cluster, those massive stars are going to collapse either directly or in a supernova and leave behind a population of massive stars. This happens on a very rapid time scale, right? This happens um, generally for massive stars on about a 10 mega year time scale. Now, once I have this mass, these massive particles in this dense stellar environment, in this collisional environment, each black hole is going to experience many, many, I don't know, close passages and far away passages with other objects, sort of gravitational encounters that slowly sap energy away from the, away from the, uh, the actual black hole. So if I imagine that I just have some massive black hole traveling through a sea of stars with some velocity v, you know, as the massive object travels in one direction, it's going to gravitationally attract a wake of objects towards it, and as it moves out of the way, it's going to build up a self-gravitating wake of stars behind it. And that self-gravitating wake is going to cause a deceleration to the forward velocity of the of the particles. You know, an effect we call dynamical friction. Um, by the way, I didn't make all of these slides for this talk. I had a lot of these lying around. Um, I'm very proud of them. I'm, I don't like y'all that much. Um, and so, because of this dynamical friction effect, essentially these massive particles are going to segregate into the center of the cluster. They're going to lose um, the forward velocity and end up forming this dense uh, region of black hole, predominantly black holes in the center of the cluster. And this happens on a time scale that depends on the relaxation time of the cluster. So if I have a black hole with mass 10, uh, let's say 10 solar masses, and my typical star is a solar mass, on average, this dynamical friction time scale, this mass segregation time scale, is going to be 10 times faster than the total relaxation time of the cluster. So even if my cluster is too big and too puffy to core collapse within the age of the universe, like a, say, a very massive globular cluster or a galactic nucleus, mass segregation can cause this to happen on a much faster time scale. Now, once I have all these objects in the center of the cluster, right, I still have to come up with some way to form the binaries that we're interested in, and that's kind of why we're all here, right? So if I have just two objects floating around in space and I throw them at one another, you know, positive energy in, positive energy out, there's no way to dissipate enough energy in order for this to actually form a balanced system. So even if I have a huge density of objects, two-body encounters, at least in the Newtonian sense, are not enough to actually create this. What I need is some way to dissipate that excess energy and angular momentum in order to create a bound system. I need some way to subtract the excess energy from this encounter and leave myself with a bound negative object. And so if I'm in a dense stellar environment, though, where the, say, stellar densities of black holes are 10 to the 6, 10 to the 8 um, black holes per parsec cube, you can easily imagine that I have a third interloping particle that I can actually dump that excess energy and angular momentum onto during these encounters. And just from this simple analytic argument, I can actually make an estimate for the rate at which this occurs. Because I know, just based on simple statistics and an n sigma v argument, how often I'm going to have two particles come within some certain distance of one another. And I know, based on that impact parameter, how long those two particles are going to spin, roughly at paracenter. And so I can just ask the question, for, for two particles that come within a certain impact parameter B, how often, while they're at that close paracenter passage, and I'm going to have a third object close enough together to participate in these encounters? And so if I do that, 
Um, and this calculation, as far as I know, was I think first done by Hutt in 1985. I can come up with a pretty good estimate for the rate of free body formation of binaries in a dense stellar environment. So if I have, what I've done here is because this is what I work on, taking parameters, you know, similar to a globular cluster. I have a number density of black holes of 10 to the 5, 10 solar mass black holes, and a velocity is first about 10 kilometers a second. I'll get about 100 of these per parsec cube per meteor. Um, and we think actually this is what drives the dynamics in lower mass clusters, like either very wimpy nuclear star clusters or globular clusters. The problem though is if you look on the right, the velocity dispersion goes as the, it's 1 over the velocity dispersion to the ninth power, which is an absurd, absurd power to see in any sort of calculation. And so, for, like I said, for globular clusters, this works pretty well, but we're not interested in globular clusters, we're interested in nuclear star clusters, right? Which I'm, which I'm somewhat asininely here representing as just a much bigger version of 47 Tuck. Um, and on top of that, there are, in most of these cases, and in particular in the cases we're interested in, a giant black hole in the center. I don't know what's going on with these transitions. But with, once you have this supermassive black hole in the center, and you have a cusp of black holes, and you have a cusp of black holes around it, your velocity dispersion increases dramatically. And so now we're looking at this case. I don't know what this thing's doing. Why well, you'd never use somebody else's computer. Now you have this case where the velocity dispersion is a thousand kilometers a second. You're in the Keplerian potential of the supermassive black hole, and your rate of three body formation tanks completely. So now you're lucky if you get you're lucky if you, you have about a one in a million chance, at least for these parameters, of getting a three body formation event within the age of the universe. So that's bad. So the question then is, is there some way we can get around this? And what I'm putting up here now is sort of the three ways we think you can get binaries in dense stellar environments. The first is this three body binary formation that I was just talking about, and that's out. Um, what's wrong with this thing? Um, the other option, um, which I think Fabi is gonna talk about a little bit, is what if you just start off with a binary to begin with? We know that most massive stars are formed in binaries, um, we know that a lot of those, through some complicated gastrophysics we don't fully understand, are going to collapse to form compact binaries. And once I'm there, uh, encounters with other black holes and interactions with the supermassive black hole are going to lend to more, are going to uh, potentially allow for dynamical um, induced mergers of compact <laughs> objects. The third idea, though, is what if we, there's a way we can actually create captures in these dense stellar environments? And so this actually goes back. Um, if you, if you look at this picture again, right, the reason I needed this third object in this particular environment is that I needed some way to dissipate that energy and angular momentum, right? In a Newtonian sense, there is no way, in a Newtonian point particle limit, there is no way to dissipate the sufficient energy to form a bound system. But if I just, but there are, of course, other ways to get rid of that energy. There's tidal interactions with massive stars, there's gas drag, like in AGN disks, and at least for the case I'm about to talk about, there's also the the possibility of creating what are called gravitational wave capture events. Essentially, gravitational waves during a very close parasitic passage actually take enough energy away from the system to create a bound binary almost instantaneously. And so, I can actually ask the question: What is the rate of these three body of these two body captures compared to these three body captures? And I get a reasonably good estimate. In this case, this goes back to a paper from uh, Cole Miller and Melvin Davies, and they show that for the same parameters I just showed you get about a million times increase in the rate of two-body captures versus three-body cap versus three-body formation in galactic nuclei. And the reason for that is you can get very close paracenter passages, but you don't have to deal with this obnoxious problem where you need two particles to come in and have a third particle also come in at the same time. You don't have to have those really low velocity dispersions. So essentially going down in the number of particles and the number of degrees of freedom gives you a significant, it basically gets rid of that strong ninth power dependence on the velocity dispersion, goes up to a much more reasonable 5.5 power dependence in the velocity dispersion, and you can start to form objects through two-body encounters. And this is why I really like this AGN disk channel, right? Because now I've reduced the dimensionality of the problem even further. I have just a single radial dimension that I need to deal with. And so there's real, it's, it really increases and focuses the rate of these three-body captures or these two body formations. Add to that the fact that you have gas growth, you know, you have this gas drag and this gas and this hydrodynamical way of forming these binaries and subtracting the energy. And I think it's a really, really cool way to get around a lot of the other problems we have forming uh, black holes and neutron stars dynamically in AGM. All right, that's what I was gonna talk about. I'm gonna turn it over to Fabio now. Uh, he's gonna talk a little bit about, more about the specifics.
sorry, could you use the mic? Yeah, go ahead. Can I just remind everybody to try to use the mic because we do potentially have people coming in on Zoom? No, you have to download it. Oh, okay. oh yes, sir. I will go a little bit more uh, in, the, in the specific, and I will uh, uh, describe uh, two specific <laughs> two specific channels for uh, uh, forming binary black hole mergers in nuclear clusters. And uh, I will describe what type of predictions we can make for them and uh, what they are. So uh, first of all, when I uh, think about galactic nuclei, this is what I think of. It's a massive. A uh, nuclear cluster, a massive, uh, dense star cluster, really like a big version of a, a globular cluster sitting right at the kinematic and photometric center uh, of a galaxy. Okay, and we do observe this uh, actually in most uh, nearby uh, nearby galaxies. Um, and so the first channel is uh, uh, essentially what Carl already described. You start from uh, your population of stars. The most massive stars collapse, form black holes uh, in the very high density regions of the, uh, the, the core of the star cluster, uh, where the black holes are segregated because of dynamical friction. You start forming uh, black hole binaries through uh, three body binary formation. Um, and uh, some of these binaries that you form through this process are hard, which means that they will uh, harden through uh, subsequent three-body interactions, so by interacting with other stars or black holes in the cluster core. Uh, and uh, at some point, and uh, uh, this is actually a big difference with respect to globular clusters, um, the binaries are not ejected from the systems because of the much higher velocity dispersions. They are retain inside the cluster, and they actually merge due to uh, gravitational wave radiation while they're still bound to the uh, star clusters. And this uh, leads to uh, actually uh, difference in the, uh, differences in the uh, properties of the, uh, of the sources with respect to uh, sources formed in uh, global clusters. Then the other channel that we propose with uh, Haggai Perez that is sitting uh, in this audience as well, uh, is that these binaries can actually also form in the environment of nuclear clusters uh, with a supermassive black hole. Uh, again, there are uh, both, uh, both type of clusters are observed, uh, observed uh, nuclear clusters without a supermassive black hole and uh, nuclear clusters with a supermassive black hole, so we have to make this distinction. Um, if you have a supermassive black hole, then the idea is that, uh, again, what uh, Carl briefly described is that you uh, form stars through an episode of star formation, then um, the uh, lead of Kozai mechanism leads to very high eccentricities in the binary surrounding the uh, supermassive black hole, and because of the very large uh, eccentricities, you induce the uh, uh, gravitational wave spiral. So what are the predictions for uh, binary black hole, for the properties of binary black hole mergers uh, formed through these uh, two type of channels. So one way to distinguish between uh, uh, binary black holes formed through different channels is um, eventually could be looking at their uh, eccentricities. Uh, so this uh, plot shows the uh, R predictions for, uh, for the first channel. Um, you have uh, the eccentricity distribution here and the uh, cumulative eccentricity distribution from, uh, for binary black hole mergers formed in nuclear clusters without a massive black hole. And you see you have three peaks, uh, binaries. These are binaries that are ejected from the star clusters, which represent a very small fraction of the total, about 10%. Uh, then you have a second peak, which is binary black hole mergers that form inside the cluster, and then a third peak, which is gravitational wave, uh, wave captures. But the, uh, the main point of this plot is to show that there is about 10 to 20 percent of binary black hole mergers that are formed through this channel that are eccentric also uh, in LIGO, and the different plots are at different, uh, at different gravitational wave frequencies. So this is what you might be able to observe in, in LISA, where, where all uh, binary black hole mergers, or more than 90 percent of them, will have uh, maybe measurable eccentricities. 
And uh, again, this is uh, just to stress the difference uh, between nuclear clusters and globular clusters, which is uh, merely a consequence of the larger masses in nuclear clusters and uh, their higher velocity dispersions. In nuclear clusters, uh, uh, if you look at their uh, the eccentricity distribution of binary black hole mergers form in nuclear clusters, you see that only a few percent of them might have measurable eccentricities in LIGO, so much lower eccentricities than the binaries form in nuclear clusters. Uh, and these are uh, the predictions that we make for the eccentricity distribution uh, in the case of a nuclear cluster with a massive black hole, where uh, with, uh, with a guy back in 2012, um, so um, essentially no uh, binaries in this case have uh, eccentricities larger than 0.1, and this has been confirmed uh, in this, uh, I think, very uh, remarkable paper from Zhang et al. Uh, where uh, not only the lead of code mechanism was included, but uh, many other processes like uh, to body relaxation, uh, resonant relaxation, and also the evaporation of the binary the binaries due to encounters with other stars or black holes was also included self consistently in these models. But again, you find, and this is uh, these plots, these colors correspond to uh, different black hole masses, and again, uh, you find. Although these models are more complicated, a similar result to what we found here, so no binaries with large uh, eccentricities larger than 0.1, uh, and a characteristic peak around 10 to the minus 2, or maybe 10 to the minus 3 in, uh, in LIGO. Uh, mass, uh, the mass distribution might uh, also be um, different from, we expect that also be different with respect to uh, global clusters. And so what, what I show here is the maximum mass of the uh, black hole binary merger that is formed uh, in our models as a function of the escape velocity from the star cluster. And uh, nuclear cl globular clusters have uh, escape velocities that are typically much smaller than uh, 100 kilometers per second. And you see that here, the maximum mass that you form is always around uh, 100 solar masses. And these are models with different metallicity, different uh, distributions of the initial spins of the black holes, which you see don't really affect much the, uh, the results. But if you f if you go to very high velocity dispersion clusters, high escape velocities, in the regime of nuclear clusters, you start forming much larger black holes. And uh, this can only be formed uh, within in this type of, uh, of systems. Um, in uh, the case of nuclear clusters with a massive black hole, uh, here again the massive black hole really changes the dynamics in fundamental ways. Now interactions between binary black holes and singles lead to the disruption of binaries because of the very high velocity dispersions. So all the binaries that you form initially in the nuclear cluster are destroyed by these interactions. And so the only way actually to keep forming binary black hole mergers in these models is through um, continuous star formation. You, you have to keep forming uh, to replenish this uh, binary population near the supermassive black hole. And maybe the best way to do it is, again, through uh, uh, star formation that we see occurring in many of these uh, clusters, including the cluster in the Milky Way. And so this will have a consequence on the mass distribution of the sources, because the maximum mass that you can get from uh, 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 a high metallicity environment of the uh, black holes that you can get in this high metallicity environment is around um, 10, maybe 20 uh, solar masses. Uh, the spins, there is no uh, reason to expect that there would be a preferential uh, orientation of the spins with respect to the angular momentum of the, of the binary, so we expect a distribution similar to uh, the distribution uh, of uh, binary black hole mergers that are formed in the Monte Carlo simulations uh, of uh, globular clusters that Carl has been performing with the Northwestern group over the last uh, years. So a, a distribution that is picked uh, around uh, zero, but is broad and extends from minus one to one if you assume that the black holes have equal mass and uh, maximally sp uh, spinning black holes. And uh, uh, with Adrian Hammers, uh, uh, we, we have also shown that this is true for, for, this, for this channel. You would expect uh, roughly random orientations of the, of the spins, which gives these characteristic distributions, which is broad distribution, which is peaked, again, around a chi effective of, uh, of zero. And these are the predictions for the merger rates. They're 
uh, very uncertain, but um, the result is that uh, both channels uh, should produce uh, uh, a number, uh, so the, the number of binary black hole mergers produced by these channels should be uh, la large enough that eventually we would be, uh, we should detect some sources coming from, this, uh, from these channels. And uh, what I want to stress here, uh, so uh, this merger rate, I multiply this by one minus the fraction of nuclear clusters that have a massive black hole at the center, which uh, is constrained but obser from observations, but um, it is not uh, well known. So uh, observations um, show that maybe uh, are, that approximately around 70% of nuclear clusters in the local universe have a massive black hole, but uh, again, this is very uncertain. Uh, so I multiply the merger rate from this channel in which a massive black hole is present in the in the center of the star cluster uh, by the same uh, the same fraction and also by the fraction of uh, nuclear clusters that have uh, uh, the non -tel that are spherical because the, uh, as we uh, have shown recently with uh, Cristobal Petrovich uh, actually the merger rate from this channel is uh, largely announced uh, uh, if you. Uh, if your uh, star cluster is not uh, is not spherical, uh, and so this is the summary uh, of um, what we know about this, uh, the properties of the uh, binary black hole mergers formed through through these two uh, two channels. Let's thank our speaker. So, do we have any questions for our two speakers? I'm now slightly pessimistic. Um, in your model, do you predict more out of compact binaries <coughs> near the supermassive black holes in the case of neutron star versus black holes? So in uh, so in this model, uh, there are uh, very little. Uh, most binaries have uh, black hole components. Actually, I would say that all of them have, uh, are black hole binaries because the neutron stars don't uh, uh, segregate much in the center of the star cluster. Uh, uh, this channel is most efficient for, uh, for uh, forming binary black hole mergers, not the neutron star mergers. Uh, in this channel, uh, you, you would form, uh, also we showed with, uh, with this model that the, the rate of uh, neutron star uh, binary mergers is much lower than the, the merger rate. Of but in your model, do you output uh, binary separation distance? After all these simulations, like how close they are. These are you out self-consistent. I mean, these aren't full dynamical models. I don't oh, think there are there aren't like neutron star populations in there. Okay. Uh, well, there is a component of stellar. So we use a, a stellar evolution code to predict the, the properties of the neutron star binaries, and then we evolve them in the environment of the supermassive black hole. So, but. Again, the rates for, for those type of mergers are so, so the fraction of neutral star binaries that you would get uh, from our models is the same uh, as the one that you get in, uh, in the field. Um, sorry, Mordecai. Uh, no, no time for questions. Um, so uh, we'll, we'll thank our speakers. If you have more questions about this, please send your slides to Ben Say for this afternoon session, and we'll talk more about this. this so thank, thank you again to our speakers. So next up, we have uh, Aaron Cara and Chelsea McLeod, and they're going to talk to us about those gas disks. Um, so hopefully they'll give you a slightly better um, picture of AGN disks than my simple model that I gave you earlier. And, Yeah, hello. All right, um, so I'm gonna, I was asked to give an overview of some AGN observations and talk a little bit about all of the things that are uncertainty, uncertainties in the rates of, um, 
of how many mergers you'd expect. <laughs> so yeah, what, what you're really going to see from this is that with their, the constraints that we have observationally are pretty, <laughs> um, there's a lot of room for, for, uh, for learning, yeah. <laughs> so I'm going to tell, tell you a little bit about uh, just basics of AGN structure and size, and Chelsea's going to go into that more um, in depth, and I'll just go through number density, AGN fraction, longevity, spin, and disk densities, and kind of focus a little bit on um, on really x-ray observations. Um, I've been in the decadal you know, white paper zone, so excuse me if I sound a little bit like a used car salesman <laughs> for x-ray observatories. But anyway, here we go. Um, so just a basic overview. You've all seen something like this, hopefully, uh, before. Uh, AGN, we have a central supermassive black hole at the center and accretion disk around it. And we're talking about like uh, on parsec scales like 10 to the minus 3, 10 to the minus 2 parsecs um, is the accretion disk. And then outside of that, you'll have the broad line region and then the narrow line region um, photoionized gas at like 10 to 100 um, parsecs. And Chelsea will go into a little bit more on and some of the observables and maybe some of the problems that we have with some of the, the disk models um, as well. So just a little bit first on um, AGN demographics through X-ray surveys. X-ray surveys are, are a really important way of, of understanding um, AGN because basically uh, anything that shines above 10 to the 42 um, ergs per second in, in X-rays is, is going to be an AGN. Um, you don't have to worry about host galaxy contamination. Uh, you don't have to worry about mostly if you're looking at hard X-ray um, surveys. You know you're not you can, you're going to get a complete sample because you don't have to um, deal with obscuration effects. Um, and so there's a really nice view, uh, review by Brent and Alexander in 2015, and what they show is just a, a compilation. Um, this is a paper from Ueda 20, 2014. A compilation of the results of many X-ray surveys are showing a, a, a co-moving number density of like 10 to the minus 4 uh, AGN per cubic megaparsec. So, and you can see that this changes with uh, uh, X-ray luminosity. And then, um, just the fraction of, of AGN that uh, the fraction of galaxies that are AGN is also a, a strongly is strongly dependent on the the stellar mass of the the host galaxy um, but you can see it's around um, 0.1 uh, galaxies host host an AGN and for much lower luminosity that's for much uh, lower luminosity uh, AGN there's there are many galaxies like maybe 0.3 um, 30 percent of galaxies show some kind of, of AGN uh, activity um, uh, on the longevity, this is where a lot of the uncertainty, I would say, comes from. So there's been a lot of work for many years on the mean lifetime of, of an AGN, how long it lasts. And you can do that by just comparing the number density um, or the black hole mass density to the uh, quasar luminosity functions. And you can assume that the uh, radiative efficiency is around 0.1, and you get that the mean lifetime for AGN activity is something like 10 to 100 mega years. And that's consistent with the Salt-Peter time scale. Uh, um, and so it, it's showing that really on, on when you look at these things um, on a survey perspective, on an average, um, that, that black hole gro growth can be explained by, by acc accretion during uh, quasar phase. But there is a possibility that you could get, um, you know, the, the average lifetime is something like 10 to the 7 years. But, you know, can we, do we know that it's consistent accretion during that time? Or is it lots of like flickering, like, um, like a fluorescent light or something like that? Um, so there was a recent paper uh, in 2015 that looked at the bat selected. AGN. This is a hard X-ray uh, flux limited sample, um, and what they found was that there are five percent of of those bats, those AGN, are um, what they call X bombs. These X-ray bright, optically normal galaxies, 
And basically, they, they show strong AGN activity, but they don't have a photoionized narrow line region. And so basically, you can think of that in, in a simple case like this, where in, a, like in, in the evolution of this AGN activity, you have something that uh, triggers your AGN activity, and there's a light travel time out to you know, 100 parsecs. Um, before you see the, the result of that photoionized emission in the narrow line region. And so 5% of the galaxies that they're find, of the AGN that they're finding um, seem to be in this kind of early stage. And so you can use that um, to make an estimate of um, the, the time scale of, of, of AGN activity. And you get something like 10 to the 5 years, which is much, much shorter. So maybe that's Putting on the Yankee hat, it's much more optimistic for your thank you for your rates. Um, but I don't know how, you know, maybe it's too optimistic. Um, so yeah, this is the general picture of the broadband SED. AGN are, you know, of course, very multi-wavelength. The accretion disk is going to emit in the optical and ultraviolet. Most of the energy released through accretion is coming within like the central 20 gravitational radii of that central black hole, that thermal emission from the disk is mostly not observable. It's going to be in the extreme ultraviolet, uh, and, and you're not going to be able to see that emission directly. But thankfully, um, we also, as, as I mentioned, basically x-ray emission is ubiquitous in all of these um, sources, and we can use the x-ray emission as a way to probe also the inner disk structure that you can't see um, in, in thermal continuum. And basically, it's because uh, the X-ray emission is coming from what we call the X-ray corona. It's some region of mildly relativistic <coughs> electrons and seed. These seed photons from the accretion disk will be inverse Compton scattered to X-ray energies in this corona that is really concentrated within, you know, 10 gravitational radii of the central black hole. And uh, the X-ray corona produces this hard cr uh, continuum emission that we see from um, 0.3 to up to, you know, like 100 keV. Um, in addition to the continuum, that corona irradiates the inner accretion disk. So that gives us a view uh, of, of what the inner, inner disk looks like. Um, so as the corona irradiates the accretion disk, it causes fluorescence. And um, so you see lots of atomic features. The most prominent line is the iron K-alpha line. You'll have Compton scattering off of um, the accretion disk. And you can use these um, spectral indicators as diagnostics of your, of your, the structure of your inner accretion disk, and perhaps as a way to, um, you know, even see what what it, what an AGN disk would look like if there are you know gaps due to stellar mass black holes, for instance. Um, so right now most of our models are with uh, you know just slabs, uh, rotating slabs, constant density accretion disks. But you can see um, from this kind of basic model that that you can uh, use this iron K complex at, at around. 6.4 keV um, to probe the innermost region. So you'll have, you know, just from the rotation, Newtonian uh, Doppler effects, special relativistic beaming, and then importantly, you'll have gravitational redshift because uh, that emission in the X-ray band is coming within, you know, 10 gravitational radii of the black hole. Um, and so you can see this is the actual data. This is an, an observation with New Star. You see this asymmetrically broadened iron K alpha line, um, and Compton scattering off of the um, off of the accretion disk. In addition to what we see in the spectral lines, we also see that there are time delays associated with these uh, emission reprocessed emission, and in this case, it's a you know 10 to the 7 solar mass black hole, and you see the iron K and Compton hump uh, lagging by behind the continuum by around 400 seconds, which if you convert that to a light travel distance is something like 10 gravitational radii. Um, so that's kind of you know a good uh, proof of concept that we're kind of that these emission lines are probing the innermost regions around these black holes. 
So, um, you know, in addition, because you, you see this general relativistic effects, you can basically measure how redshifted your iron line is, how much gravitational redshift you're seeing uh, to, to make an estimate of the spin of the black hole, which is um, going to change the, the location of the innermost stable circular orbit. And so this has been done for um, like about 20 AGN so far. And this is a compilation that we put together for the Strobex probe mission concept, which is really going to just knock this science out of the park. Um, and what you see is in the sources that we can do this analysis with measuring the uh, gravitational redshift in the iron K alpha line, we're seeing many high spin AGN, high spin black holes. And that may be a selection effect. Because effect, 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 effect. Sorry. Those are, <laughs> those I are also. I'm on the Zoom and I accidentally unmuted it. So <laughs> pretty wild. In there. Um, you know, your radiative efficiency is going to increase with the with the spin of the black hole. So these are also going to be the brightest sources that you see, and then therefore the easiest to measure their spins. So there may be a selection effect here. Um, but just as kind of an aside, we can also we also see, as we saw in the first talk, broadened iron K alpha lines in stellar mass black holes as well. Um, and in that case, we kind of see a little bit more of a range of black hole spins, but also uh, a lot of high spin black holes. And so it's, it'll be interesting to, to compare that to the results that we're seeing in the chi effective from uh, gravitational wave uh, black hole binaries and something I'd like to discuss more, more with the group here. Um, and then lastly, uh, can we get a, a diagnostic for the density of the disk this one's um, a little harder, and maybe this is a little more <coughs> speculative. Um, but but uh, one of the observations that we see often in these uh, spectra of re reflection off of reprocessed emission off of the inner accretion disk, in addition to this broadened iron K emission line and the Compton scattering off of the uh, off of the accretion disk, there's also very oftentimes this soft excess. Uh, just a, a below 1 keV that regardless, it's a very smooth feature, and regardless of the mass of the black hole, it can be pretty well described with a thermal component uh, of a, around 0.1 keV. So it's, it's really too hot to be actually associated with the, the thermal emission from the accretion disk, and since it doesn't change with the mass of the black hole, it's likely not to be um, emission from the seed photons from the accretion disk. But there's been a lot of debate in the community uh, as to what is the origin of this soft excess. So um, maybe you remember from a few slides ago that there are a slew of other uh, atomic features expected uh, at below 1 keV. And so it's thought that this soft excess could be due to um, just all of these emission lines that are relativistically smeared, and so they kind of form into a continuum. That's consistent with the fact that we see short light travel, or well, we see short lags associated with this soft excess. But it could be um, there are like other models where, that, where this soft excess is, is associated with some hot inner flow, um, an, an additional Comptonizing continuum component. But in the model where the soft excess is due to reprocessing uh, off of the disk, perhaps you can use that as a diagnostic for the density of the accretion disk. And this is uh, new work from, or recent work by Javier Garcia, um, doing the, some, showing that if you increase, basically everything that we've done so far in, in fitting these spectral features has been done with a, a constant density disk of, um, with an electron density of 10 to the 15. And, but if you increase the density of that accretion disk, uh, it's, it does little to change the, um, the, the iron and the Compton scattering. And, but what it does change um, is the free-free heating. And that goes as the, the density squared. And so you, as you increase um, the density of that accretion disk, it could fit better some of the data that we're seeing where you see this strong, soft excess. Uh, and 
Jia Chen Zheng uh, is, is working currently on a paper doing a, a compilation of these things uh, in fitting the soft excess with these new high density models and is finding kind of a range of, uh, of densities. So this could be a, a, a new indicator of disk density. And now I'll turn it over to Chelsea who will go into more details on reverberation mapping. Okay, so just quickly, I, I wanted to uh, show two observational results, basically, um, that show uh, disagreement with our standard thin disk theory. Um, and uh, basically, the two results are that the observed disk sizes are much larger than we would expect from theory, and also um, the uh, time scales that we observe are, are much shorter than we would expect for a steady state thin accretion disk. Um, so just really quickly, the um, uh, intrinsic, oh, there's echo, <laughs> the, the intrinsic um, optical variability of AGN uh, is on the order of 20% or 0.2 mags over time scales of months to years. And um, you can see an example light curve up there on the upper, upper right panel for NGC 5548. Um, and this optical emission we know contains some amount of reprocessed UV emission and this comes from reverberation mapping of the disk which I'll talk about in a second and on the lower right hand side you see the the, the spectrum of a type 1 AGN um, and uh, so you, we, we do know about the structure of the broadline region from measuring um, lags between the emission lines and the continuum variability um, so this is all enabled by the light travel time scale. So this is the first time scale I'll mention here. Um, so uh, basically the time it takes for light to travel throughout the disk, if you can measure the response of different emission regions in the disk, you can constrain size scales. Um, so, and, and <clears throat> we know that from thin disk theory uh, that there's temperature gradient. Thank you, if that, that was the perfect thing. Um, and so uh, assuming this temperature profile um, and that the inner hotter regions of the disk irradiate out onto the, um, uh, the cooler, more distant annuli, you can actually measure, you can constrain the relative sizes of these annuli by measuring time lags between the different bands. If you monitor them in different, monitor the source in, in different bands. So this is continuum reverberation mapping. And um, uh, one particular study uh, by Fasna et al. 2017 um, showed that by monitoring, well, well, there, there are a few AGN in the paper, but for this example in the upper right hand side, by monitoring it in UGRIZ, um, they find that the time lags between the different bands um, shown by uh, at this, the, these data points. Are, are very different from the thin disk expectation, which is shown by the uh, blue dash dot line right there. Um, assuming so, this blue dash line was predicted um, for the given parameters of that source, the black hole mass and the accre accretion rate. Um, so, so and and results from microlensing are also consistent with this. So, results from quasar microlensing also show that um, disk the absolute disk sizes of an AGN are few factors larger than what you would expect. It's also possible maybe we have the temperature gradient wrong as well. Um, so lastly, I'd just like to mention that um, the time scales in general that we see for the intrinsic variability in a given band are confusing. Um, this is because, so for a steady state thin disk, um, or for a sudden change in fuel supply, you might expect to see changes occur very gradually over the viscous time scale, um, which is shown here. And uh, this, this in the optical emitting region of the disk should be thousands of years, so much longer than we can observe. Uh, yet we do observe time scales of you know months and years in disks. So. Um, what's going on? Well, there's probably disk instabilities going on. Um, so. Uh, this, this is the shortest time scale you would might expect to see. Physical changes of the disk is on the dynamical time scale. 
Um, and, and also then there's the thermal time scale. And the thermal time scale is about you know few years. Um, so from the observed variability of stripe 82 quasars, we found the average time scale, characteristic time scale of quasars was consistent with thermal time scales. So that indicates maybe there's some localized thermal instabilities in the disk. And this might even imply an homogeneous disk. Um, secondly, uh, I just wanted to highlight um, exciting new class of quasars that we are calling changing look quasars. And these, these objects, so they, they um, exhibit a type one agent with broad emission lines in one epoch, and then um, in the next epoch, the, the broad emission line goes away. Um, and this is associated with a very a strong continuum change. And this happens um, very short time scale. So very much shorter than you would expect for an accretion rate change of a disk. So um, there are some um, possible explanations that involve um, that involve um, accretion disk instabilities to explain this. I'll leave up my summary and uh, take questions. Thanks. So do we have any questions for our uh, engine disk speakers? I'm a bit more optimistic. Than if yeah, I'll just hand it to, to Aaron if you have a question. I guess I was just trying to say, I mean, so the the optical, I mean, can can some of this larger disk size be explained by the optical is just re reprocessed, you know, X-rays or UV from the inner parts? I mean, I'm trying to understand. Does it really mean maybe if we get to the outer parts of the disk, we're not seeing the intrinsic luminosity of the, of the disk at that point? But, um, I mean, yeah. I mean, if if anyone else in the room has a has a good <laughs> answer, please, yeah, feel free to chime in. But yeah, I mean, it could it could be. Um, I'm not sure about that. It could it could be that the disk is inhomogeneous, and that um, so on average the the radius that you're measuring for a given emission region it's actually it appears to be much larger because the disk is inhomogeneous. But you're also seeing like changes in the the continuum in the optical as well. That, right? You're saying you're saying it wouldn't you wouldn't expect the reprocess to be. A There, there's definitely time delays of like a few days. That's what Chelsea showed on the first couple slides of, of uh, that's the that's the kind of like travel time that you'd expect from X-ray radiation of the of the disk. Um, but yeah, this is sort of somewhere in between, like you know, way too short way shorter than a viscous time scale, but kind of longer than what we measure in uh, from just light travel times between where we can actually see the correlated x-ray and yeah, the optical. And there are some um, constraints from reverberation mapping of the continuum that it, it's the optical light is not completely just irradiated flux from x-rays and UV. So maybe, I think there's an estimate that maybe 25% of the optical flux is um, re reprocessed emission. And indeed, in some other sources, you don't see any sort of correlation between X-rays and optical light. Yeah, another question. Yeah, another question. Anyone else? Uh, so, like, well, just I'm curious: Are there ones where there's both lensing and reverberation, and do they agree on the sizes? Oh yeah, so that's a good point. So for um, there, there was a, a, a I think there was a plan to do that, but I'm not sure if it's been done yet. I, I I'm, I'm not sure because I. Maybe I haven't been paying attention, but yeah, if you can do microlensing and reverberation mapping for the same source, yeah. that would like essentially give you three-dimensional size constraint. So you get the line of sight and the projected size from the microlensing. Um, so that I'm would be. I'm surprised if there aren't. Well, it's, it would be very difficult because it, usually it's quasars that are being microlensed. And quasars are much more luminous, and their variability time scales are much larger. So you have to be just staring at it for a long, long, long time, and resolving each of the images. So from the ground, at the position that you need, that's very difficult to do. I'm sure people are trying. I just haven't heard of any. Mm -hmm. so, OK, folks, um, if we can thank our two speakers again. <laughs> early morning sessions. We're going to have a half hour break. Um, please talk, introduce yourself to, to people. Um,
We're going to be back here at 11. Now would be a great time if you haven't already sent your slides to the various sessions that you're, you're interested in uh, advertising or, or talking about something or raising a point. Now would be a good time to email your, your one slide. To or you can now drop box and I'm creating folders for each session which will be in place in about two minutes. Here. Fabulous. Okay, other than that, have some coffee. Okay, thank you. Significantly larger scale. Huh. 
it doesn't have a killer app. This, in terms of finding. No, you know, I'm doing some things. Hey, how's it going? Okay. So you can see, yeah. Oh, 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 yeah. Oh,
Well, I was last year, like, I was like <laughs> hosting this, spearheading it. I was a part of last year, but okay. I didn't yeah. really anymore. Yeah. Are you enjoying Except for when I get reminded that I'm supposed yeah. to, like, submit a new paper that's happening, and then I'm like, oh, yeah, I'm definitely, definitely working on it. Is that with Robin or something? No, 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 that's actually the morning time. Yeah. Okay. So. Exactly. And do you like Princeton? Yeah, for the most part, yeah. Mm-hmm. It's always kind of nice to come back into the city, though. I it's different. I do there. really miss it. It's yeah. slower. But, yeah, it's, it's nice. It's yeah. Like officially it's nice. They're like birds. Oh, my God, that's something I always point yeah. out. Yeah. Like, I walked by a park today, and I was like, birds are chirping. Yeah. yeah. It's, like, such a big deal to hear birds. Yeah, because they're, like, back, and they're loud. They're not, like, <laughs> like dying pigeons or something. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> How big is your class? Four people. Okay. I'm the only girl. <laughs> oh, wow. Well. Yeah. But of four, so yeah. it's kind of small yeah. number statistic. Yeah. yeah. Exactly. I was thinking of, are, you, is it, are people giving talks or like discussion? There's like, um, there's a discussion after, is it after three? Wait, I have to say. Yeah, I think it's like once we do the, the like, overview talks, there'll be some yeah. more discussion. Is two more plans? I think he's just participating in discussions later. There's two more talks, so 20 minutes, and then a summary of all the previous talks, and then lunch. And then discussion started. Yeah, I know. It's crazy. really cool oh, color. They're beautiful, yeah. I might get sick of this after a whole month because they last forever. So I really like it. It's my first time doing powder. Yeah. Mm. I, I saw someone again. Yeah. It's, it's like cheaper, but it looks yeah. it's like more lumpy and weird. And, and it lasts for a month? Yeah, at least three weeks. So you can see it's like they dip it in powder and then they put yeah. it in. I saw someone had that done. Apparently it lasts the longest. Yeah. Okay. Why is it cheaper? It's like it takes sure. longer. It lasts longer. It took forever. Huh. I'm so tired. I think you were there for like three hours. Or so. I also got a pedicure, but yeah, they were. It was the lady was really slow. Yeah. There's this one guy there who's super fast and the best, but it's hard to get him to like make an appointment. <laughs> Oh, okay. oh man, the other day I was they running late know. and I had to put my laundry in so that I could change it to the dryer before going to like breakfast or whatever. And I go down there and there's like two washers, like they're only four working washers. Two have like, you know, 20 minutes on it. Two have like two minutes on it. I'm like, great, it's gonna work out. So the guy comes and he's like pretty on time to move his laundry, which is always good because otherwise you have to play the whole like, do I take it out? Do I get it in? Wait. He was like pretty on time, so I was really jazzed. But then he was the slowest human you've ever met. He like, oh man, he was so slow. It, wasn't like, it was like 10 a.m., so it wasn't even like it was like really early in the morning, like or something like. And he like literally two items of clothing at a time. He would take out, he would like straighten, and then walk two items of clothing over no. the dryer. <laughs> I just, and then we go back <laughs> and two more and I had a wait for him to empty two full washing machines this way. And it took him maybe ten minutes. And I was just standing there being like, you know I'm waiting, right? Like I'm not standing with a full basket yeah, of laundry room. in the laundry room just to so chill weird. here. Yeah. It was like I was like, this is <laughs> it'd be like hot. Well, I wasn't so impatient it'd be funny. <laughs> now it's funny. 
Do you want to catch up for a minute? Catch up? Yeah. Sure. Okay. <laughs> Roommates. Too, so. It's fine. It's fine. It's fine. <laughs> Apparently they have some yeah. some gossip that we're not going to do. Yeah, so she's here back with them this week. So you were at Yeah, yeah, I took a gap year between. I did my undergrad at Columbus, so I took a gap year between undergrad. Yeah, my last time. Yeah, exactly, yeah, you're in astronomy there. It's okay, it's okay. It's okay. It's okay. It's okay. It's okay. No, physics is much bigger, yeah? Yeah. 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 Too into it. <laughs> yeah, how are you? How are you like it? I like it, yeah. Yeah, I like your acting. Yeah, I mean, it's definitely a cool place. Yeah. Well, so we do like semester projects, so I'm doing like rotations. So last semester I worked on simulating eight engines, and this semester I'm working on Lyman Alpha escape fractions from high range of galaxies. So what do I work on? Who knows? <laughs> like, I'm literally working on four completely different things. So I don't know. Two to four, they're not strict about it at all. Some people want to live in the They don't really care. Yeah, it is. An, I don't know. I mean, I'm, you did uh, how to do two right single year projects at Columbia. Don't they make you do that? No? You just went right Mostly in? Just, uh, oh, <laughs> Who do you work with? I work with Sabi. Yeah. Okay, cool. Oh, yeah. 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 Uh, yeah. Yeah. So in some ways it's kind of weird because it's like you don't know who you're working with. It's like, you know, yeah. You have to be pretty like self motivated You know what I mean? Like, cause it's like you're a little on your own. Like, I didn't really tell anyone I was coming to this because, like, who would I? Like, I, you know, I told the person I'm working on this semester. I was like, because we usually meet on Mondays, and I'm like, can't meet on Monday. And I like told the professor. We had the problems that do for tomorrow, like you know, like. But it was like there's no like there's very little oversight. Uh, so sometimes you can kind of feel like in the darkness, and then there's like, yeah, you like don't know who you're gonna end up working with or what you're gonna end up doing. So it's like kind of weird too. Cause it's like where do I invest time? Like, like I applied for like a plasma physics summer school, and it's like, but is that a good use of time? Am I gonna do plasma astro? Like I don't know. Like so. It's kind of weird. So, but yeah, like I, I chose printing because I was like excited to do different things. Yeah, and, like, it is exciting. and then you also realize this is like my fourth new project I've started since I started doing astronomy, right? And like you realize at a certain point that like the first month or two of every project is identical. It's like download the software learn how it works like you know what i mean like start with some code learn how it works like and it's kind of the most boring part of any project where you're like messing up trying to use someone else's code <laughs> or like trying to install something on a cluster and it won't install and it's like yeah right like and like once you get into a project you get to do science and stuff and like but like you know the first month of a project is like software stuff and it's like really boring <laughs> yeah pretty much yeah so like yeah with this one i'm like god i'm just so sick of it like learning how one cluster or another works i mean i guess i'm biased because i do like all computational stuff so if you don't do computational stuff i'm sure it's slightly variations on the theme but like it's like <laughs> Uh, yeah, so they're, yeah, so I was like really gung-ho about rotations, and now I'm like, well, they're actually so much fun. The literature reading is kind of fun, because you're like, let me learn something I don't know anything about. <laughs> That's pretty fun. If they're on the same, like, general field, as useful. Yeah, yeah. 
just walked around and something super random. Oh, no, I'm doing something pretty random right now. I don't know. It gives you a breadth of knowledge. Yeah. I, I guess I'm kind of proud at this point that I have a pretty broad yeah. knowledge base. At least computation. Once you get into observation, I don't know how useful I am, but. <laughs> anyway. Yeah. Are we almost back? Okay. okay. I literally have to type in oh, I a well, no, like like for every minute. Ah, yeah, yeah, of course. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so, so, I'm so just, changes every day. <laughs> yes. So I'm gonna. I'm on the Okay. Oh, for lunch is yes. noon, yeah. Lunch okay, yes. maybe I can't remember yeah. which email. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, because he was using the uh, the plumber potential with the smooth and all of the results is that approximation. And uh, that was the default also for the model that you're doing, but uh, it recently changed. But I that changed back now because I found out that the one. I mean, yeah, the, the potential that I put as default is not really friendly, you know, because it is, um, it's, 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 uh, it's continuous. So if you get too close to it, uh, it's going to lead to a crash. Yeah. So actually, uh, uh, if you said when you, uh, if you want to compare with, uh, with what the particle pro is doing and that and the plane of the page to, with this motion that he uses is the appropriate one. Anything else will lead to a difference because a difference because most of the torques are coming from the region very close to the orbit. Yeah. yeah. And that's definitely going to yeah, not going to matter. Um, oh, okay. Here, oh. Yes, I'm not a file or a Okay. Also, I'm like this, right? The next section. Let's see you again. Are uh, yeah. things going? Yeah. Uh, yeah. We're going. Pretty much. Oh, the last of I got last of contact. I'm not looking forward to reapplying a grad yeah, it's not a fun yeah. process for yeah. 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 It's got tired. Yes, uh, like I have to. I have to. Definitely. Yeah. Uh, good luck. Yeah. Uh, so, how do you like this? I don't live there. I commute. Commute. New York. Or vice versa. Luckily, this semester I have to. I, I only have one class, so I have to be there, oh, and I have like this study study, so I have to be there twice. And then I have the option of There was a here for something else, and then I took a I was getting married, so that's the only experience I have to test on. It's, it's, uh, it's like, it's, Ah, okay, okay. So you're, uh, what, what do you do with uh, the uh, okay. So that's a uh, okay, okay. Like right. I can't take it back. It's just sometimes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm, uh, 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 I'
Is it done? Is it done? What? You're uh, everything. Yeah. everything. I'm a scientist, so yeah, yeah. I'm just gonna say it's cool. Yeah, yeah. But like, it's it's like really nice. Okay. You said the market mission to. So are you? What's the deal? Is like a follow up? Like old people like say follow up. Oh, okay. I don't have positive things. Oh, like, I, I can't think of it. Well, other than the commute part, right? That's nothing, nothing to do with me. It's just me. Well, that's like, that's the one thing that I'm like, ugh. But everything else is good. Part of Lego. Well, it's okay. it's okay. 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 So you expect to be a in the beginning? It's uh, when, when you guys start, we start. I want to make sure that it's more for the program. Oh, wait, it's on. I see it. I see the lights. I see the lights. <laughs> okay. Oh. Yeah. yeah. So, 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 how does it work? So, so somebody like when he texts, uh, you know, the way, I guess, and he's gonna send out uh, uh, Wait a minute. right away, and then you get it. Oh, this is the yeah. Uh, yeah. So you can whatever you can. Yeah. Then you know what? Tomorrow. Like the, how? How? Tomorrow. Yeah. Yeah. And then uh, uh, so, so no, so oh. I don't <laughs> But you'll have to like handle this today. Okay, okay, no problem. Oh, yeah. And I was just like, I was like, wait, put this in the Now I'm looking at it like, oh, <laughs> So you basically have to, you know, take your time, you put it in the air or Yeah, I'm trying to help. 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 I'm trying to help
Simulation. So we've already talked about populations of objects in galactic nuclei, talked about the properties of the disks. Now we're going to talk about how you might simulate those, those disks and some of the problems that we have with that. So our speakers now are going to be uh, Vlad Lyra and Andrew McFadden. And uh, take it away. Thank you very much, Barry. So uh, yeah, this is uh, a primer on, on how to, uh, to model disks. Uh, so this is the uh, the, the Cartoon idea, right, of aging disks that that was shown also um, before. I would say that in astrophysics we have three kinds of disks, right. So the first are protoplanetary disks, the other one are, are galaxies, and the third one are aging. And as you can see here from this image, we do not have observations of aging <laughs> to the same type that we have from the other two cases. So um, um, even then, in this case here, these are also uh, quite recent ones. But we've been modeling uh, protoplanetary disks already for some time. And I hope that this, I thought that this model would play. But apparently it's not playing either. Oops. No. 
uh, I think it was plain here though. Uh, somehow, if I try to play from this library, it doesn't yeah. go, but from there it goes, right? So this is a, a model done by... Huh? Make it big. Make it big. Right. I'll try to make it big. Oops. There you go. Okay. Right. So this is a, a model done by Mario Flock of a, a disk that has a, a, a magnetic field in it, so then you can see the whole disk going turbulence to the, uh, the MRI. Um, so uh, we expected this this process to also happen in the AGN disks. What you see now is the uh, the magnetization of the disk, right? and the the, uh, the fluctuations in in density. So the the state of the, the art when it comes to when it comes uh, to modeling uh, protoplanetary disks. I would say that there are uh, five major pieces of, of physics that we need uh, to model them, which is uh, MHD, which is nowadays done in, in both uh, ideal and, and non-ideal. The gravity of the disk, which is hey, which is in, important when it comes to, to massive disks. Dust, which will not matter in AGN, but in protoplanetary disks, it, it does. Uh, the chemistry also, uh, because the, the temperatures are low, and the ra uh, radiative transfer. Now, I would highlight here the radiative transfer because that's what I would consider one of the weakest links. It is hard to do both uh, hydro and RT in a, a, a calculation, so what is usually done is that we only do post-processing for Monte Carlo. And uh, what you're seeing here is a, a planet in a protoplanetary disk. This is the tree, the hydro uh, um, a density field that you get. And then you pass that through a radiative transfer code to get what the image would look like. Uh, to include the radiation transport in the, the hydro, Many uh, approximations are needed, like either FLD, uh, uh, flux limited uh, di uh, uh, diffusion, um, in a, in other other fields actually do um, uh, ray tracing, but somehow that has not made yet to uh, to this modeling. Uh, ray tracing definitely would be a good avenue to to move to. So these are the type of codes that one usually sees in, in, the, in, in modeling disks. So uh, grid-based codes, uh, Eulerian, they are quite good when you have the, the geometry of the flow matching the geometry of your grid, right? Um, Self-gravity is usually hard to, to code, right? Because it's, it, it, it's an it, it, elliptical, uh, problem to, to solve. Um, in the past few years, have seen the, the emergence of GPUs. Right? GPUs, they are fast, but they are limited still in, in memory. So CPUs, um, per core, they are uh, is lower, but you do not have the limitation of, of memory. So uh, nowadays, we can do models with thousands or uh, a few uh, few tens of, of thousands of, uh, of processors, and the resolution that can be used can, can be up, up to, to, uh, to about 1,000 points in, in each, um, each one of the, the, the three uh, uh, dimensions. GPU is not yet to, to this point, but it's much faster per core. So uh, a, a, a recent model using four G, GPUs could do 20 orbits per hour, right? That, that's quite, uh, quite, quite good, even though uh, the resolution in this case was still quite low. So uh, you can do about like 10 times less uh, resolution, but you can calculate it much, uh, much quicker. The examples of these codes would be Pluto, Athena++, the Pencil Code, or Fargo. 
Lagrangian codes are, uh, I mean, one of the, uh, the most well known of, of this is SPH, right? Um, uh, Smooth particle hydrodynamics. Di 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 they are quite good when you have free boundaries as we usually have in, in astrophysics, right? But they are not so good to model in instabilities because they cannot capture well the contact uh, uh, discontinuities in, in the flow. And also there is a fact that you are modeling, I mean, you add more particles, I mean, you, you have them where the density is largest. So if you wanna model gaps or the, the atmospheres of this disk is where the, the density is low, then you, you intrinsically have less, um, have less particles there, right? Though it is quite good to model gravity, right, because uh, that's what they are mostly used uh, for. And two examples of these codes would be the gadget code and phantom. So, um, and so this has been mostly about protoplanetary disks, right? So why is it that we cannot just uh, rewrite our articles, just uh, replacing uh, protoplanetary disks for AGNs? So uh, I, would, I would define four main differences between the two kinds of, of disks. The first one is that AGN disks are completely uh, ionized, right? Whereas uh, uh, protoplanetary disks are not. They are poorly ionized. I would say that that's actually a good thing because disks is one of the, the few problems where MHD is actually much easier than non-MHD, <laughs> right? <laughs> so, we already know uh, um, reasonably uh, well uh, how a, uh, how MHD uh, works in in this because that's the uh, the MRI which has been modeled for decades now in 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 disks. Um, relativity it's unimportant in protoplanetary disks, thanks. And even in AGN disks, it's really only going to to matter when it comes to the the inner parts, right, of, of the uh, the AGN, like quite close to the uh, the black hole. So, if you want to model that part, yes, you you uh, you must model that with GR. But if you are interested in the outer parts of the the disk, then that's not going to uh, to matter so much. Now, uh, the other bit which I would like to get to is the the presence of retrograde orbiters that in protoplanetary disks we don't have them. So we have a, a whole theory that we are still working on in protoplanetary disks about how planets interact with the, the gas. They orbit in the disk, they, they, they exchange angular mo momentum, and then uh, they migrate. This migration can be either inwards or outwards. We uh, do not know yet how that works. If you have uh, retrograde orbiters or, or highly uh, uh, inclined ones because um, they are simply not there when 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 it comes to, to protoplanetary disks. So uh, the migration trap. Well, uh, so if a torque is positive, an orbiter migrates outwards, and if it's it's negative, it will migrate inwards, right? So uh, in this point here, you can see the, an orbiter is moving out, and from this point, it is moving in. So this point is a migration trap. Right? This migration trap, thank you. This migration trap works in this way. You have here many orbiters right in, in a disk. As they migrate, they are going to uh, converge to that point. Uh, we did that for protoplanetary disks, and as you add many orbiters, this is essentially what you get in the end. What you're seeing here is the eccentricity and the distance from the they, they start. And um, here is how the distance changes in time, right? So this was crowded when it came to, to protoplanetary disks, even though we only have 10 orbiters there, right? Imagine now what would happen if you had 100,000, as we, 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 we expect in AGN disks, right? In this case, then, uh, we don't know exactly what would happen. I think that that's one avenue that that must be uh, uh, explored, right, with models. Like, what happens when you have crowded uh, migration? 
uh, with I'm out of time, so then I will I will conclude now. I will just leave the the points. So if you wanna ask about them after we're done with the talk, I'll pass the mic and out to end. Putting on my pessimistic hat, but it's just because simulations are difficult. <laughs> they are. <laughs> um, so uh, let me talk about um, a, a really interesting problem, which is uh, an accretion disk. This is just a cartoon, but of a binary at the center of a disk. And uh, it's kind of interesting because the case of a single black hole has really uh, been studied to death. But just putting a binary at the center changes things in really interesting ways. Uh, for this meeting, uh, we're just going to move the binary <laughs> kind of out into the disk. But you can imagine that modulo the shear of the disk on large scales, the physics may be very similar. So basically, you have a binary embedded in gas, which is interacting viscously and gravitationally with the binary. <laughs> so there's some very interesting uh, physics that happens uh, here. So this project is uh, rich. It's been going on for decades. Uh, there are many models in classic papers in 1D that assume angularly averaged torques on the binary due to gas. But it's kind of obvious that multidimensional effects can greatly change that, that picture. So there have been simulations in two spatial dimensions, which are already challenging, uh, because we have to run for many thousands of orbits to get into steady state. Um, so Armitage and Natarayan did this. I, I worked on this in 2008. Um, and then most, re and then there's been a lot of really great work. And most recently with Zoltan Hyman, who's here, and Yeki Tang, a student at NYU, we've done some recent things that I'll show you. And there's also been recent, and this is with a, a moving mesh code called DISCO, which I'll describe. And there's also been some recent work uh, using their repo code uh, as well. Um, in addition, very recently, there's a, a preprint that came out last week uh, in 3D, uh, Newtonian simulations using Athena++. OK, so here's the kind of old picture of a circumbinary disk. Imagine now that this is, this is no longer circular. You're in this kind of flow of the, of the AGN disk. And the idea is that the binary can excite waves in, the, in this gas. And that waves, those waves, those overdensities, can torque back on the binary and affect its orbit. Uh, and so the old picture was that that'll happen in kind of a self-similar fashion until the black holes start to emit gravitational waves, and then they might peel away from the gas and merge on their own time scale in vacuum. Um, and then you're left with a single black hole, so maybe it doesn't get a kick, it just sits there. And then at viscous time, gas comes in and lights it up. So that's something you might expect in an Aegean disk as well. If there was a binary there, at first it might be relatively, uh, it might have opened up a cavity, but over time, that'll fill. So the question is, we want to understand in detail if that picture is correct. And to do this, I'm going to give you a little bit of a primer on, uh, on, on hydro. <laughs> and so the equations we are solving, uh, we do this both relativistically and non-relativistically. It's more clear to show the non-relativistic version. And it's very simple. These are conservation laws for mass density, momentum density, and energy density. And those things are conserved if there's no right-hand side. And gravity would be a right-hand side, so a source term on the right, which I don't have here, but which we have for the binary. Uh, so the basic general form for any type of conservation law is that the time derivative of some vector of conserved quantities, their densities, are changes, changed by the divergence of fluxes of mass, momentum, and energy that are the solution to these nonlinear coupled partial differential equations. So those are notoriously difficult to solve analytically and require uh, solutions on computers in almost all cases. So the basic idea, just a real simple, is that this is space and time, and we're in 1D. We have finite volumes, and we represent each finite volume by its mass density, momentum density, and energy density. And then if we look uh, from a time slice here to the next time slice, what we need are the fluxes of mass, energy, and momentum between the faces bounding each numerical cell. And that's what the computer does. 
Uh, and so the, the, they generally look like this, that uh, the dense, let's say the mass density is upgraded to a new time uh, by the difference in flux between the fluxes on each bounding cell. So it's a very simple principle. The problem is those fluxes are nonlinear, but luckily Riemann in the late 1800s actually solved. This is one of the few uh, exact solutions to a nonlinear partial differential equation, uh, and it's uh, brilliant, uh, but, and we use that. So the, the, what happens is if you have a, what's called a shock tube problem, so high pressure on one side, low pressure on the other, and that can be used to model any kind of flow that's broken up into pieces, uh, then you want to know how much energy mass and momentum is flowing across an interface, and that solution is known. So the solution is a, the Riemann solution, and when it's a bunch of waves, not there's a shock, there's a contact discontinuity, and there's a rarefaction. These are well known. Um, but, and typically for the Godinoff codes that are Eulerian, so a fixed mesh, what you do is you solve for the fluxes at a fixed point in space, and you allow these waves to transport mass, energy, and momentum across your face. But what's really interesting, so uh, in the previous talk we heard about Lagrangian methods, the fact is we actually know the Riemann solution for a, uh, for a face that's moving at any velocity. It doesn't have to be sitting in space, it can actually be moving. So what's happened recently is codes have been constructed based on Riemann solvers that are written on moving meshes. And this is one example. Um, don't know quite how to make that happen. Uh, is there a way to click Yeah. You, um, this thing? Uh, use yeah. the mouse. No, no, no. Oh, mouse. this mouse, OK. Yeah, yeah you can see the mouse right there. Yeah. OK. Try left clicking. OK, cool. This is just a sample problem showing a shear flow that may happen in a disk. And what's, what's done is space here is, is tessellated using a Voronoi tessellation, which is a known unique tessellation of space. But what's really cool is that this is at very low resolution and is nonetheless capturing the features of a very, uh, of, a, of the Kelvin Helmholtz instability. So the kind of a test problem, and this is in relativistic MHD, this is a code written by Paul Duffel. And the idea is um, that for disks, that can be great because most of the flow is supersonic orbital motion. And you don't want to be passing energy, mass, and momentum through a grid that's fixed in space supersonically because it's diffusive and would result in numerical diffusion, which is a form of viscosity, uh, which doesn't exist in astrophysics at the levels that would be here. So that's, that's called TESS. And that, that, this is similar to a REPO, uh, which is used in cosmology. For disks, however, we realize that the changing shape of those Voronoi cells can potentially add uh, noise to the solution. Not always, but if you're trying to do thousands and thousands of orbits, it can be an issue. And since most of the motion is uh, azimuthal around the central mass or binary, uh, we use instead uh, a cylindrical mesh, but it's allowed to shear. So each face can move at the local Kepler speed. So the faces are moving with the bulk motion of the fluid. And that means there's much less uh, diffusion. And so it's a cartoon of that is, is this. Just Obviously, it's a much higher resolution. But this is the idea, is that you can solve fluxes even though the faces are moving. And this allows for very accurate integration of the equations of, of, of a hydro. And this gives an example for a, for a, a, a disk, uh, of a circumbinary disk, in the co-rotating term of the binary. So before, so basically, what we find is that gas does accrete. There is a cavity. But gas does accrete onto the binary and forms mini disks around each black hole. Gas is sh shared back and forth between the black holes, but this is a very bright source. So if there were binaries in AGN disks, you might expect uh, accretion of this sort to be lighting up uh, the, uh, and be observable. So that uh, might be a, a clue. Um, so uh, the basic picture from the simulations we get is that there's a cavity, but it's not round. It's elliptical. It's off center, and there's gas making it into the cavity onto each black hole. There are mini disks around each black hole. There's a lump, a uh, non axisymmetric feature in the disk, which speeds the disk. And this is the final picture is that you got emission from all these components. You have a shock here, you have shocks here, you have spiral shocks in the circumbinary disk. So it should be a bright source. Uh, most recently, uh, this is a source that's em emitting gravitational waves. So it's starting to merge due to gravitational wave emission. And what we find very interestingly is even as they start to merge, there's still gas on radial plunging orbits that stays connected to the black holes. So they keep on, uh, you'll see it speed up, 
they, they keep on accreting all the way until merger. And at the very end, you'll see the merge, and there's still gas there. So the point is that this electromagnetic counterpart won't die, as far as we can tell. It'll still be there. So there's gas at, at merger. OK, so um, the interesting thing that we found from those simulations, in fact, though, is that the, uh, the torque, the gravitational torque on the binary, depends on how you treat the sink of gas around each particle. And in fact, uh, we, we found in the paper here that, th that you have some positive, you can have positive torques on the binary. So it's not necessarily, it's still uncertain, as we heard for the protoplanetary ca case earlier, it's still uncertain whether the torques will be positive or negative. And in fact, we find a positive or negative depending on uh, details of the calculation. And this has been confirmed recently by, in papers by Miranda et al. And, and Moody et al. So this is an important question that we should discuss more uh, at this meeting. OK, thanks. So any questions for our speakers? Um, in that final uh, model, are you using radiation transfer to understand the uh, escape of the radiation? In, in a very simple way. So we have uh, an opacity in the disk, and we calculate the surface uh, temperature. It's all consistently with the fluid equations. So we have kind of thermal emission from the surface of the disk. What's your equation? Of, are you cooling the central disk structure, the, the yes. disks around each other? Yes, we're, 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 we're solving the energy equation, and we're cooling, mm -hmm. and self-consistently heating. And we actually find, it for the single black hole case, we, we find the Shakuras and Yayev solution. Yeah. This, by the way, is a torque map showing the subtle difference between getting a positive torque and a negative torque. It's a really detailed question. Really important one, but it requires a lot of work and to not be hasty in making pronouncements. So we're, we're working on it. Any other questions for? Yeah. yeah. Uh, so you mentioned that the uh, talk is next. So I was totally <laughs> focusing on the last few minutes okay. of your talk. Um, apologies. Does the torque? So this this uh, does the positive torque only impact a certain part of the binary coalescence? Is it all positive and then it's negative and it's positive again? It's always fluctuating. It's like zero and it's going like this. Yeah. What you yeah. have to do is average it over thousands of orbits. It's a really tricky problem. So in terms so, of the gravitational wave signal, this would make kind of chirp, anti-chirp. It, 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 it could. So you'd have to smooth it over some yeah. time scale. So the question is, how quickly can it respond? Yeah. And that'll depend on the mass of the disk compared yeah. to the mass of the binary. That's right. So, but it's a really interesting dynamical problem. Okay. For massive disks, yeah, you'd have some, you, you need to do a live binary, which is on our uh, to-do list. Yeah. yeah. Uh, one more question, and then we'll have lots of time for questions tomorrow in the disk sessions. Yeah, coffee. Just following up on that, presumably these were all circular binaries. What happens if I start off with something that's form eccentric? It's much easier to torque at apoapsis. Yeah, so it, uh, I see I wasn't planning on talking about this, don't worry. <laughs> uh, so, yes, that's what we're doing right now. Uh, this is an eccentric okay. binary. And so we're calculating torques from these, and you're absolutely right. Uh, the torques are, are much, much larger out here. And they tend to be uh, positive. So that's what I'm finding, what we're finding so far. Uh, but you can get these really interesting things. People talk about tidal disruption events as think this flares from the centers of galaxies. You can imagine sometimes these disks go away and then they reform. So you'll see that. So anyway, it's an interesting idea that maybe some TDEs or things like this. But yeah, so eccentric and, and unequal mass ratio is, is a work in progress that so you should. Keep her, I, we should have soon. Okay, so uh, let's thank our speakers again. And we've talked so far about uh, populations of objects in black nuclei. Uh, we've talked about disks. We've talked about how to simulate them. And now we're going to look at some of the end results of, of what we're talking about. The first one, Gravitational Michael wave Lisa. signatures.
Yeah. The very top. Very. This is this is the end. Wonderful. Take it away. Oh, yeah. Okay, so back to this one. Okay. I have to push. I have to push. I don't think you have to. No, I don't have to push. You may have to turn it off. Ah, okay. Just turn it off. On? Yes? No? Maybe? This one's definitely working. Hang on. Give me the mic. Okay. Use this. You can share this. Okay. No problem. Very funny. Okay. Test, test. Yeah. <laughs> because this is a time. All right, okay. I'll start the 20 minutes time. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Um, so I think we decided that we are the ears of the elephant. We'll talk about two <laughs> different ears. I'll be one of the ears, and Shao will be the other ear. Yeah, very large ears. <laughs> very large ears. Uh, uh, since we're trying to hear the, the signature of uh, potentially uh, sources coming from these AGN desks. Um, so uh, we're going to talk a little bit about what sort of things you can deduce about coalescing binary black holes uh, with gravitational waves. <laughs> you may have heard that this is possible, and you may have seen some of this before because gravitational waves have been observed. Uh, and now I have to do my happy dance. Um, <laughs> we have we've we've seen uh, the coalescence of two binary black holes. I'm making a shadow uh, that are orbiting. Should I do the? You <laughs> <laughs> okay. Impinging on the detector, I'm sorry, I'm going yeah. to... <laughs> impinging on the detector, as they get closer and closer together, the orbit gets faster and faster and faster, and so they're going to us, merge, and then ring down. Okay. Not be the end of the interpretive yeah. No, we're, we're, we're going to do this a lot. That's all okay. video, uh, right? Producing uh, uh, each one of these calculations, this is an actual numeric relativity simulation, uh, will produce a specific prediction for whether response to the detector. Repeating this, you know, hundreds of thousands of millions of times because CPUs are cheap. Uh, well, not really, but something like that. Uh, we can, uh, com by comparing them, figure out uh, what sort of source was responsible. Uh, we can infer the masses of objects and spins of both black holes. Uh, and as we'll talk a little bit about, about later, these, the eccentricity. So these are a couple of the older binary black holes. This is 15, 12, 26 with an interesting spin for one of the... the sorry, uh, what is this plot showing? I'm oh, sorry, I'll, I'll back up. I, I was assuming that more people had seen this before. So this, these are the uh, inferred posterior mass distributions yeah. for a couple of binary black holes. And this are for the more massive black hole and the less massive black hole. This is the magnitude of the spin. And this is the misalignment angle of the spin. So this is saying black hole one is probably spinning. It could be misaligned. And this one says, eh, I don't know. Uh, I don't know, maybe negative. Eh. Eh, maybe small. Eh. Does that help? Yeah. <laughs> now, uh, and this is uh, looking at plots like this, you can probably see where this is going to go. Um, or maybe not. Uh, now, uh, though some things are, are accessible, uh, some observables are particularly useful, not only because they're easy to measure, but also because they're preserved over long astrophysically important timescales. Uh, one particular co uh, combination that you may have heard of, this uh, chi-effective or effective spin that came up in one of the presentations earlier, uh, is a combination that's, that's conserved on astrophysically important timescales. Uh, and by measuring it and looking at this distribution, we can infer something about some things that happened a long time ago. Uh, so that's great. This is all in the context of LIGO. The other ear will report shortly. Um, but the problem is we have two ears because uh, it's important to highlight that we have multiple ears to hear the universe. And the, the, the signals that I just described uh, reflect uh, the complicated nonlinear dynamics of general relativity, uh, whose uh, strength, nonlinearity, and, and nature changes over time as the signal evolves. And therefore, the nature of the information that's being encoded changes with time and with frequency. And therefore, the questions that you ask really depend on which ear you want to use. <laughs> and they depend on your instruments. And, uh, and even also the physics that you want to get out. I mean, there are some simple, simple things that you can imagine doing to say, these are my observables, in some naive, simplified physical scenario. Like if all, everything is quasi-circular, I can come up with something concrete. But that's uh, maybe a completely different set of observables that are appropriate for very massive black holes and describing binary black hole radio. So what we're going to talk about uh, a little bit uh, instead is the physics of merger and how that you can get out the physics of the merger from the gravitational waves that you see. Now, to, we have a whole bunch of gravitational wave detectors operating or operating soon that provide different 
pieces of the puzzle, probing different frequency spectra, uh, and some of which can be used to go after the same sources. And it's these two that we're going to focus on right now. Um, we should switch sides temporarily. Uh, no, under this, under this one. Uh, the LISA side of things. LISA is a, uh, will be a space-based gravitational wave detector. You should yeah, probably say launching that. Launching in 2034. Launching in 2034. Okay. Uh, <laughs> LIGO in space. In LIGO in space. For those people who haven't seen. Uh, and it's sensitive to uh, low mass, uh, supermassive black holes of the sort that could potentially be the, the host of the things that we're interested in. Uh, but it can also capture um, isolated um, stellar mass black holes, which evolve over from LISA into LIGO. And I want well, this this figure in particular from Alberto Sassana's paper highlights something that's very important to see: is that this same source in this detector might not evolve at all, and it might be a pretty Newtonian orbit at a frequency that's many orders of magnitude smaller than the LIGO band. So it's largely Newtonian. You're not really seeing that much interesting relativistic dynamics. Whereas the same source over here, evolving for a long period of time, will have complicated nonlinearities where you may have access to different pieces of information. So what are those pieces of information you might have access to? Um, well, there is something, you know, uh, there's uh, one thing that's uh, probably apparent is that we can say how long it took to get from point A to point B slowly spiraling in, emitting gravitational radiation, getting into a tighter and tighter orbit. It'll coalesce and merge and ring down. Now, the problem is, if this was all that there was, it'd be really degenerate and really boring, and we wouldn't be able to get a lot of information out of it, because we'd be really only sensitive to something that's extremely degenerate and doesn't have a lot of features. So most of the interesting things that we like to talk about are things where things get more interesting, where we have some sort of symmetry breaking process. And one of the nice things about this channel is it offers all sorts of opportunities to do the things that we love, which is make the signal complicated and fun. So that's what we're going to talk about. So one of the, the simplest ways, for example, to break symmetry is just have some sort of spin in the system and have the spin misaligned with the orbit. Have to dance. Angular momentum direction, angular momentum direction. I'm beaming radiation in both directions. And I'm gradually processing, so I'm pointing towards you, lashing you with gravitational waves right in. Away, flashing the gravitational wave from the left hand, and away. So you'll get pulses of polarized radiation. Polarized radiation, which is cool. Now, <clears throat> the other symmetry breaking feature, which is important for if we're going after the sort of things that LIGO has seen both so far, which is 30 solar mass plus 30 solar mass and above, those are very short mergers. And the physics I talked about previously, as we'll, we'll, I'll comment on in a second, uh, is something that occurs um, relatively slowly. Uh, this stuff is guaranteed to appear. There is non-quadrupole emission beyond the leading order of well, quadrupole uh, that you would expect. This is very subdominant. This is a plot versus time in GR units, mass, uh, and some measure of gravitational wave strength. Well, you can see the dominant mode is dominant, but at late times you get all sorts of fun, interesting physics with different orientation dependence. And in fact, each one of these modes has a different characteristic frequency which is roughly m over 2 times the frequency of the dominant mode, which I'm trying to illustrate here by showing the Fourier transform of the dominant mode and some of these other modes. You can see, in effect, that by looking at a fixed frequency, we're, in a sense, looking at snapshots of the binary at slightly different times, which can be cool. Uh, additionally, all of this stuff arises from lots of interesting strong field physics, which, by breaking symmetry, gives us access to new things. And it occurs pretty often. This is a plot of the fraction of signal amplitude that occurs as a function of mass. And it increases rapidly as you go forward. I have to hurry. The other thing that, I, that we want to talk about and highlight is um, precession. Now, again, this, this varies very wildly between one ear and the other ear, as you'll see in a second. And I'll transition to the much more fun case of, of please sentence. So, when you have a binary that's sitting on its own, it's radiating left and right-handed radiation. And if it's tilted, it's radiating left and right-handed radiation. And as it's slowly orbiting, it's basically doing exactly the same thing it would be doing uh, due to its precession as if it wasn't precessing at all. So there is some kind of modulation of these complicated waveforms. So this is a real, what a real waveform would look like. And all of this is just taking the, the stuff that you saw on the previous page and rotating it with the appropriate angular momentum operator. So not everything you remember from quantum mechanics, but 
it works in GR2. The, the stale recouplings and spin spin couplings are standard. This is the sort of thing that you can find in celestial mechanics. Uh, in fact, the 2pn spin orbits evolutions are solved. Uh, and because they're Hamiltonian, uh, the, the really nice thing about the early on spin evolution is that the, um, the early time information is still encoded and sticks around all the way to merger. So potentially, there are clues about the dynamics encoded in the configuration of spins. But wait, you're thinking, you're talking about in spiral. And wait a minute, I've, I've, I've saw, I saw those pictures of the gravitational wave protection, and there wasn't a lot of, there weren't that many cycles. And so there's, it's hopeless because the precession frequency is very, very low, which is true. However, if you look at this very closely and squint, okay, I, I, I'm kidding, you can't actually squint and see what I'm about to say. Uh, the, the combination of modes happens to conspire such that the black hole, when it's formed a single black hole, so this is going to be my hair, I'm a little black hole, encoded in its little ha hairy head. It's still doing something like this. Even though it's one black hole. So the post-merger oscillations get imprinted that, with the configuration of the bits. So there's a lot of fun things that are conceivably accessible, even if you have a high mass binary. Uh, now, that precession is wonderful because it breaks all symmetries. It gets even more exciting if you have a long duration signal. Uh, and I'm going to not talk too much about this because you were going to talk about it more in a second. Um, in the strong field, there are lots of strong nonlinear couplings. The precession cycles are, are few in number, but as we said, uh, this is what I said previously, in the extremely strong field. Okay, great. We're good. We're good. We're good? Yeah. Okay, I don't have to speed up. Okay. <laughs> <sighs> okay. So, um, as I was saying, uh, so this is what I was saying before, is that in the very strong field, there are uh, uh, potentially direct access to the binary dynamics, even though you have a single black hole. So even though you're looking at something that only nominally has a few cycles in it, you would think, if you see it at high enough signal amplitude, you'll still be able to pull out some clues about the uh, binary physics. And this is for the sort of thing you'd see for a comparable mass merger. If you have any sort of mass ratio at all, you might end up with a configuration that looks like this, which is much more like the Lisa sorts. We have extremely complicated modulation due to precession, or, I think my eccentricity slide is gone. I had a diagram for eccentricity, it's gone. Do you have any? Okay, we will. <coughs> and could also happen because you have eccentricity. The orbits aren't always circular, as you saw. Sometimes they can be eccentric. And as they spiral around this eccentric orbit, as they approach the closest point in the black hole, uh, the orbit gets gradually tilted due to the conventional effects that you might remember from spinning orbits and short shot curve. Now, you might say, well, do I care? Hopefully by the time of, at this point in the conference, you've probably heard that you do care. That eccentricity is great. Now, why as a relativist do, do I like eccentricity? Because eccentric signals uh, are long and complicated and break every symmetry imaginable. Generally, they're going to be eccentric and processing simultaneously. And in fact, even for sources like 5914, uh, it's very possible to measure ex eccentricity if it's even remotely close to being present in band. So these are incredibly rich uh, signals from a gravitational wave point of view. Uh, I'm not going to go through all of them because Ben Say is here and he can comment on his own work. Uh, but it is certainly possible to measure the, eccent uh, the eccentricity of a compact binary as long as you have enough, enough eccentricity occurring close enough to band. So it's really an astrophysics question. If you can make it, we can measure it. Now, the problem, of course, is yeah, this is hard. GR is hard. Everything I said before is hard. A lot of these calculations are estimates based on in-spiral only. It's really hard to get a model that has eccentric merger and rain down that's done fully self-consistently and phase coherent. Yes, yes, yes. All true. But those problems can be fixed if the science return is high, high enough. And I think it is. Before I take over, can we get a round of applause? For <laughs> <laughs> I don't want anyone to mistake the applause for me. This is <laughs> definitely for you. OK. So um, I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, LIGO in space. This is Lisa. 
So Lisa will launch in 2034, and it's had a little bit of a complicated history, but all we need to know for today is that it has all three arms now. NASA is a junior partner. It's an ESA-based mission, uh, and you can find out more about this wonderful detector here. Um, I should also mention that it has a Pathfinder mission, um, and the Pathfinder performed almost as well as the full LISA was expected to, and so we are very, very optimistic for the 2034 launch. I also want to mention that um, my bread and butter is not the elephant, but more the rhinoceros <laughs> over here, but I'm also very interested in elephants. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> So right now I'm going to tell you a little bit about uh, gravitational wave sources that we find in the LISA band. Uh, and so here we have baby supermassive black holes, 10 to the 5, 10 to the 6 solar masses that are merging. But for today, uh, I think that the most interesting thing to think about are the extreme mass ratio in spirals, which are emrys, or uh, intermediate mass black holes um, that are merging with either compact objects that are a few times the mass of the sun, or an intermediate mass black hole, which is again around a thousand times the mass of the sun with a supermassive black hole. So these are the uh, what we're really gonna look at today, which are relevant to this workshop. <clears throat> so Steve Drasko's image here is of one of these Emory systems. So when I say an extreme mass ratio in spiral, this is 10 to the four to 10 to the seven to one in terms of the Q, which is the mass ratio. And so at least I can see Emory's up to Z equals one, so a redshift of one. And you can see any kind of uh, complicated waveform modulation from the supermassive black hole spin in these emrys. And in fact, you can have a huge number of wave cycles that are detectable with LISA here. So we expect there to be something like 10 to the 4 to 10 to the 5 wave cycles in the LISA band. With that many wave cycles, you can do really exquisite parameter estimation on black hole mass, spin, uh, et cetera, all the binary parameters, except for the distance. Distance estimates are still not great. That's still around a 10% error. And that's not good considering how well you can measure all of these other parameters. The rates, of course, vary by orders of magnitude. So with, with LIGO, this also varied uh, quite a lot in the early days. This is still true here until we make the first detections. And sky localization is good to a few square degrees for these sources. Um, I should mention, John Gare has done a lot of work on this. He's not here today. Um, but a lot of his papers are very good, and there was a recent overview um, by Pau here on Emery's. So one idea, well, Richard and I had quite a few ideas that we got really excited about um, that we cc buried on when we were talking about these things. And one is, can this exquisite space-time probe tell us about the gas in the supermassive black hole accretion disks? If you can measure so many of these wave cycles, the gas will modulate the waveform in the gravitational wave. And if you have a lot of these, can you actually probe that kind of physics? Um, I think the answer is yes, but we'll, we can discuss it later. I'm also really interested in these multi-frequency observations. Now, Alberto Cezana's 2016, uh, 2016 figure here shows um, the first ever detected gravitational wave source migrating from potentially the LISA band into the LIGO band. But my idea here is to say, well, what's really interesting is the time scale between leaving the LISA band and entering the LIGO band, because this can really tell us about the environment around the black hole. And I think really anything that modulates this time scale will be accessible and interesting in both the LIGO and LISA bands. So for example, gas can cause this evolution to be accelerated. It can cause it to be so accelerated, in fact, um, that it makes it undetectable. So there's got to be some sort of sweet spot in the parameter space where there's enough gas to make this maybe a few years instead of 10 years, but not so fast that it merges before it gets uh, into this band and is undetectable. Um, so I think that this is a really interesting question that we can talk about today. I'd really like to discuss this. So I also want to highlight Andrea Dudzinski's work um, I'm not going to explain too much about this because hopefully where, she was sitting in the back. She must be in the bathroom or something. Oh, <laughs> she's won an Oscar. So uh, uh, her, her work here, and I think all of the co-authors are in the room except for maybe Paul Duffel. Uh, so uh, I'm really excited to highlight this here. So um, she's done some work on intermediate mass ratio in spirals, or IMRIs. And, no, sorry, I don't want to confuse you at all. <laughs> 
so these IMRIs have mass ratios of about 10 to the minus 3. Uh, and again, this can be a compact object, like a black hole or a neutron star around an intermediate mass black hole, or an intermediate mass black hole around a supermassive black hole, right? And so um, these mass ratios are 1,000 to 1. And what uh, Andrea and um, found together with Andrew is this effect of positive torques, which I think is really, really interesting. So the gas disk can actually slow down the in-spiral, which then makes everything very confusing because the gas is supposed to accelerate uh, the merger time scale, but then these positive torques will decelerate it, and it can be both positive and negative. And so I wanted to make sure that I had this clear earlier because what you can eventually see is this accordion effect, chirping and anti-chirping. And I think that this would be a really distinctive signature in the gravitational waveform that we can go after. Um, and I just said that. So uh, the multi-frequency, again, can be detected by LIGO, LISA, and also by LISA and the Einstein telescope. The Einstein telescope is the next, next generation gravitational wave detector. It'll be buried underground. It has a LISA-type configuration, uh, will be cryogenic, uh, will do all of the things in the future, solve world hunger as per usual. <laughs> Um, and so anyhow, so this is one of the uh, nice images from their paper. Uh, here, this in the middle is your black hole. This is a secondary intermediate mass black hole. And you can see it moving uh, through the accretion disk here. But I'm sure Andrew will talk about this later. So questions that I would really like for us to discuss during this meeting are the following. So Emery's, um, is it possible to get a host galaxy association for these sources? Given the poor sky localization and the not so good distance estimates, is this really going to be a feasible possibility? I'm not sure. Um, we can probe a certain class of disk where the disk is present in these AGNs. So if the AGN turns off, then you have your black hole binary system that could start flying around, right? Uh, and so actually, this might be the av a new avenue to study the duty cycle of an AGN disk that could be related to these rates and these detections. Also, can we constrain the time scales between the gravitational wave bands going from LISA to LIGO? Again, anything that affects this merger time scale really could be constrained with these multiband frequency observations. The positive torques I find very perplexing. Uh, the alliterations might make me tongue tied because I haven't had enough coffee. But um, the slower merger time scales, the faster merger time scales, I'd really like to see how this plays out and what we can explore uh, in that particular venue. And finally, uh, Richard and I were also talking about this. We're going to find lensed AGN, which means that the gravitational wave signal will also be lensed from these sources. And that could enable us to either, well, it will definitely enable us to see further, but it might also boost the event rate of these kinds of, uh, of sources. So I'll leave this up here, and we don't have to discuss it immediately. I can also send this to Bensig because he asked us to, and I, and I didn't do it, and I'm sorry. But um, I would really like to discuss these things during the meeting. So thanks for your attention. So um, I'm wearing my optimistic hat for uh, 03 and Lisa, because I'm very optimistic about that, and also for Richard's dancing. Um, so, I'm very optimistic yeah, about no, that. <laughs> so do we have uh, questions for our speakers about it? Uh, so uh, I think uh, Sabi first, and then uh, yeah. So, so did you, you just made a case for a um, gap filling detector on slide 18? <laughs> yeah. Oh yes. Gap. This would be great. Oh, yes. 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 Someone should Absolutely. write a white paper. <laughs> <laughs> well, in fact, I don't know. Just just off the top of my head. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Come on. Come on. I, I don't know that you could get there in the strain, but in terms of the frequency, this is where you could time individual millisecond pulsars if you yeah, were so basically timing is. the hell out of them, forgive my language. Yeah. With NGBLA, I don't know, white paper, white paper fever, sorry. <laughs> yeah. I was wondering about the, uh, the, uh, the positive torque, right? You, you were... That's his fault. That it showed. <laughs> no, 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 <laughs> the image there, right? That it showed. Can you put again the image that you showed Jorginsky's about the, plot, that yeah. one? Yeah. So that's a model that in protoplanetary distance has been done since age immemorial, and nobody has ever seen a, a positive torque in this case. So what is actually causing the torque here then to to? I, I defer to the uh, authors. So, uh, <laughs> it's what I mentioned earlier. It's the sink rate. It's how quickly you remove gas to model the black hole. 
So in the protoplanetary case, the uh, just a point mass without any uh, mass removal. So if you move mass very quickly, the torque the torques change sign. So if you have a black hole, it's qualitatively different than a planet. So the mass goes on to the black hole. Yeah. Oh, but the mass goes on the planet too. I mean, like, no, no, but not removed. at the same speed. Yeah, it's not removed. at the same speed. That's true. But there's also two differences gets... in this simulation from some other planetary protoplanetary dis simulations. One is that this is being moved in at a rate given by the gravitational wave decay rate. So the planet is being moved, right? No, but the We're gravitational also... wave in this case is going to be quite slow, right? The, uh, the, uh, the time scale for this, which would be the, the, uh, the equivalent to type two uh, uh, migration is about like uh, one uh, uh, million me, you know, years. So actually, that's not. Isn't the time scale here different? Is, uh, yeah. This, the inspiral rate here using gravitation is way dominant. Mm -hmm. It's in the end stage where the gas perturbation. What is units is that axis? Yeah, I guess that's the, the, the question. And what? how close are these? These, these, these are, are all fabulous <laughs> questions for this discussion. You know, we're not yet on Tuesday, but. Uh, Two, this will be very really interesting slide for Tuesday. <laughs> yeah. Yes. So uh, I'd like to thank all of our speakers again. Uh, oh, so I have to make a okay. comment. Sorry, not scientific. But Andrew and I submitted a proposal to the NSF, and we asked uh, forty thousand dollars to be the choreographed dancer. <laughs> <laughs> Would you do it for 39,000? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I think I can. Yeah, yeah. Well, I think you, uh, you were not on the panel. Because unfortunately, it was not funny. Oh. 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 Yeah, you can interact. Yeah. Maybe next time. You need a YouTube video. Awesome. Yeah. On that note, I'd like to thank all of our speakers for this morning. So thank you. Okay, so. Um, I'm the only thing standing between you and lunch, so I'll make this short. Um, you've heard the longest talks that we're going to have at this workshop, um, and the idea is that for the discussion sessions that we're going to have, um, you should email the one slide that you're interested or in. Or put in the appropriate Dropbox drop folder. <laughs> or, or put it in the Dropbox folder, uh, but make sure the, the chair of your, of your session that you're interested in knows what slides to, um, uh, to deal with. So send your one slide to whatever session you're interested in. Uh, email it to the... Or more than one. I mean, people can contribute more than one session. Yeah, exactly. So yes, you can, you can email one slide per session, you know, so you, you have five opportunities <laughs> to share your work or other people's work or raise questions that you think should be raised. Um, uh, so again, the idea is that we have a interesting discussion in these, these sessions. The chair is going to guide the discussions. And when your slide comes up, if you can essentially talk about what it is you want to talk about. And the chair will sort it of move it off. Also be worth so I was just going to finish. So the, the first part of the um, the discussion session is going to be different people talking about the stuff that we're interested in. And then the second part, I want the chairs to sort of focus on things that we can use to to decide what hat to wear, <laughs> right? So I'd like to know whether I'm wearing, I'm buying a whole bunch of Mets hats for everyone in this room, or a whole bunch of Yankee hats, right? So. Um, so in the in the latter half of the discussion session, if we can focus the discussion on, you know, work that needs to be done to distinguish between the optimistic and pessimistic viewpoints for, for the session that we're that we're discussing. So um, hopefully you've got a sense of the elephant in the room. Uh, you heard from the ears. We've we've heard from the tail and the legs. I can uh, get you to decide which one is which. Um, and with that, enjoy the rest of the meeting. Please go and talk. I've already involved in fascinating conversations, one or more of them. Um, so please go and have lunch and enjoy the rest of this workshop. Okay? Thank you again to all of our speakers.